this is it. Last lecture. Today is Monday, December 6th. Uh, 2021. We are going to, I, I say sensory introduction, but really we've already been introduced to the sensory uh, systems. We've talked about it a lot since the beginning of class, we start talking about the integumentary system. So really our goal here is kind of just to synthesize the information that we've already talked about and kind of give it some reference uh, to make some sense of it. So it's going to be a, a pretty, a uh, a broad overview of the systems. Obviously, all of these organ systems, uh, sensory systems really have been uh, studied extensively and we could spend a whole semester talking about them. Uh, but uh, we're gonna just uh, talk about the basics and, and a lot of it is, is re-emphasizing things that we have already discussed. And then we'll finish off with a little uh, fun activity to understand how it functions. And then uh, the rest of the time really will be uh, an opportunity for a uh, review to ask questions, uh, anything about the processes or the concepts that will be covered on any of the remaining three exams, the lab and lecture exam, which again, hopefully at this point, after taking four of them, you know exactly what to expect from those. And then uh, that uh, cumulative final exam, which is going to be 100 multiple choice questions. You'll have two hours to complete it and uh, it should be pretty, uh, hopefully, straightforward. All right, questions on any of that? All righty, away we go then. As I mentioned, we've talked about all branches of the nervous system now. We spent a lot of time on the central nervous system. Uh, we talked about somatic motor and autonomic motor uh, extensively. Uh, so now we have talking about our special senses. We've even done some somatic sensory, which we've talked about. Uh, so now, like I said, we will talk about our special senses. Now, again, you walk into any kindergarten class and they got the great pictures on the wall of the five senses. What are the five senses you see on the wall of that um, kindergarten class? Give me one of them. Sight, smell. Oh, sorry. Smell. What else? Vision. Taste. Touch. Um, hearing. Hearing. Anything else? There must be something else because there's five of them. There's touch. There we go. Excellent. Perfect. Excellent. So those are our five senses that we talk about. However, like let's take touch, the one we talked about first in the integumentary system. If you think about touch, we talked about pressure. Uh, we talked about temperature. We talked about pain. Uh, we talked about that fine discrimination. Right. We talked about uh, the movement of our hair. Each of these in and of themselves have their own special sensors, their own pathways of carrying this information. So if you think about it, just here within touch, uh, we could have of uh, five different senses plus more uh, just there and there. So when we say five, it's really a tremendous oversimplification. And even still, are there other senses we haven't uh, talked about? Sense of humor, sense of dread, being able to move things with our mind. Are there other senses that we have that we don't have on this list? Balancing. Hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. Right, absolutely. Our balance and equilibrium is one that we talked about. If I spin you around in a chair 16 times and ask you to run back to your seat, you're gonna have a very hard time doing that. And this is just in humans. Uh, other uh, other uh, systems have echolocation or they have electrical allocation in this in the fish and all sorts of stuff. So there are plenty of different what we could call senses. However, so that we uh, don't have the um, those kindergartners be wrong all the time, we'll lump all of the touch stuff together into our somatosensory system. Again, our sense of smell is. Uh, is perceived by our olfactory system, taste by our gustatory system, sight by our visual system, 
hearing is our auditory system. And remember, hearing takes place in that internal ear. And if you remember in that internal ear where the vestibular cochlear nerve goes, remember we talked about two sensory structures, the vestibule and the cochlea. And since that equilibrium balance is also there in that inner ear, we'll just call it 5A. And then all those kindergartners can still be correct that we have five senses. All right. Now, regardless of what type of information we are bringing in with these special senses that we have, there are some general rules that we have to perceiving the world around us. And these are true for all of our senses. The first issue that we have to deal with is that we have to convert some type of external stimulus into the language of the nervous system. Now, the language of the nervous system sounds very, very fancy, but what is the language of the nervous system? What does the nervous system use to communicate? Action potentials. Exactly. So our first challenge with our sensory system is to take sound or to take light or to take touch or taste or smell and convert that information into action potentials. To perceive things from the outside world, we have to be able to take that stimulus and convert it into an action potential signal. Now, the more cells or receptors we have that are sensitive to a particular characteristic, uh, the better our detection is going to be. Right, And I can give you several really simple examples, but probably the easiest one of this is to look about six inches to the right of your computer screen. As you're looking six inches to the right of your computer screen, can you see that there are words on the screen? But while you're staring six inches off to the side, can you actually read any of those words? No. 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 And the reason for that is that along the surface of our retina, we don't have an equal distribution of cells. We've seen the retina and we know it's located in the back of the eye. But as it turns out, in the center of our field of view, where our focus is, we have a much, much higher density of cells, where in the periphery, there are much fewer cells. So when you're looking to the side of your computer screen, the image from your computer is falling onto the side of your retina, where there are fewer cells. And because there are fewer cells, you're able to see the light, you're able to see that there are different colors there, but you're not able to see the individual letters. You can't make out that information because you don't have enough cells there. So the more cells that you have that are sensitive, the better the detection. Again, this is not a new concept. We talked about this in touch. Remember, we talked about how we have many, many more of our tactile cells and our tactile corpuscles on our hands and on our face and on our lips. So we're much more sensitive in those areas than we are like, for instance, on our back. So again, this isn't a new concept. We've talked about this before. We're just emphasizing that. And then lastly, another concept that we've talked about as well is that the more receptors that we have the more cortex in our brain to be able to process it. If you remember when we were talking about the somatic sensory and the primary motor cortexes, we talked about those homunculi, those big funny looking images that had huge hands and huge faces and huge lips, where they represented that the part of your brain that has the most processing power is related to your hand or to your face. Even though your trunk is the biggest part of your body, there's more cortex in processing information from your hands. We have more receptors there, and we have more processors up here to make sense of that information. And it works the same way in hearing. It works the same way in vision. It works the same way in all of our sensory materials. Some information is more important than others, so we have more receptors to it to make us more sensitive to it. And then we have more co cortex to process that information. Again, these are not novel concepts, pretty simple, pretty straightforward. 
And again, here is that homunculus that we talked about before. This one happens to be for somatosensory. So again, as you can see, there is a huge amount of cortex associated with the hand, a huge amount of cortex associated with the face, especially the lips, especially the thumb, because those are the areas that we have the most receptors. And those are the areas that we have the best discrimination. When we explore the world, that is what we explore the world with. We explore it with our hands, we explore it with our face, because that is where we're able to best detect things and most easily process it. And again, remember this funny looking image where the representation of the parts of the body are the size of the cortex we have. Remember is that fun word homunculus, which is probably something you'll have to spell at some point. All right, questions on that? All right, and we did that, excellent. All right, so as I mentioned, our first rule in perceiving sensory information is we have to take external stimuli and turn it into what again? The language of the nervous system. Which is? Action potentials. action potentials. Absolutely, we have to convert it into action potentials. Absolutely. This process is called transduction. And what makes our special senses special is that they have specialized organs that their job is to take that information and convert it into action potentials to do this process of transduction. Now, as we mentioned, we have special cells that are capable of doing this. We talked about an example earlier, which again, I told you I would take away participation points from you if you did this, but as a thought experiment, if you push too hard on your eyeball, what happens? You see like white. Yeah, you almost. see a light, absolutely. Because there's a light at the end of your fingers? No, because you're stimulating those receptors and those receptors are specialized for one particular type of information. And obviously the ones in your retina are specialized for light, right? What other type of information do we take in from the world around us besides light? Pressure. Pressure, absolutely. Pressure. Pressure. I'm sorry? Temperature? Remember though, temperature is tricky. Temperature, remember, we don't actually perceive actual temperature. We perceive changes in temperature. Okay, pain. Okay, well, so, but I, I think that things like temperature and pain, uh, and temp, temp and pain, those all kind of fall into those kind of pressure or mechanical forces. Uh, so when we think of pressure, we're thinking of mechanical forces. Uh, that are being expressed upon those. There's one more main type of information we take in from the world around us. Hormones? I don't know. Oh, okay. I like sound, but turns out sound is actually a pressure receptor, right? As we know, air waves push against the uh, eardrum, and that is what we perceive as sound, and is, of course, as, as we have all been famously been told, in space no one can hear you scream. Well, that's accurate, because when you scream, there are no, there's no air, no pressure waves to push on your eardrum, and so actually our sense of hearing is another type of mechanical force. But is you guys, say again? Is it chemical? Bingo. Taste and smell, right? Taste and smell are chemicals. So light, pressure, or mechanical forces and chemicals are the three types of information that we take in from the world around us. So not surprisingly, we have three types of receptors. Mechanoreceptors, which measure that force, measure that pressure. Our chemoreceptors, which are again, those lock in key where the chemical reaches in there and stimulates a response. And photoreceptors, that respond to light. Now, as we also know, are our photoreceptors just randomly distributed throughout our body? I have some on my left ankle that I can perceive light from. 
and some on my right knee and three on my left elbow, two here on my cheek. Is that where my photoreceptors are distributed throughout my body? No. 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 All of these special sensory receptors are located in special organs. Some of these we've talked about and some of these we haven't given the name for, but I will give you the name. We already know, as we've talked about up at the top of our nasal cavity, we have that olfactory epithelium where those uh, olfactory nerves come down, providing our sense of smell. Our taste, as we've talked about, are on our taste buds inside, uh, primarily on our tongue, but also located within our oral cavity. Vision, those photoreceptors are located in a specialized organ known as the retina. I think these are ones that we've kind of talked about already. Hearing, remember we talked about there being that cochlea, which is a specialized structure that houses a, uh, our sensory uh, receptors in a structure known as the organ of cordy. And then remember for our uh, equilibrium and balance, we had that structure called the vestibule. Oops. The vestibule, and again, because remember our, our vestibular cochlear nerve is cranial nerve eight. Uh, and it houses the special receptors that give us our sense of equilibrium and balance. Three specialized structures known as the utricles, the saccules, and the semicircular ducts. So again, these two terms are really the only new things we've added to the story. We've heard these terms before, but there are these specialized structures inside of them. And we'll briefly take a look at all of these. Let's start easy. You've pretty much learned everything you need to know about the olfactory uh, system with the exception of really, just the introduction to it. Humans are actually pretty good. We get, we get a bad rap when it comes to olfaction, but our ability to be able to distinguish smells are pretty good. We can distinguish over 10,000 different scents. Now, again, like a bloodhound can distinguish, you know, over 100,000 different smells. So, you know, we pale in comparison to them, but we're better than many organisms on the planet. And also for some smells, we have an incredibly low threshold where even the tiniest amount of it, one single nanomole in solution is something that we can perceive within a gas. So why do we get such a bad rap when it comes to our sense of smell? While we're very good at perceiving, while we're very good at distinguishing, we can't maintain it. Humans adapt incredibly rapidly to a smell. When you first perceive a smell, you are instantly aware of it. But within the first second of perceiving that smell, we lose 50% of our sensitivity to it. Our sense of smell, and remember we've used this term before, habituates very rapidly. Has anyone ever been in an estuary before? Anybody know what an estuary is? No, <laughs> I don't. An estuary is a bird sanctuary. Has anyone ever been to a bird sanctuary before? When I was little. When you were little, do you remember anything about it? No, not really. Okay. I was going to say that even if you were little, the one thing you might have remembered if you've ever been in there, or if you've got a friend who has four birds that they keep into their house, um, birds reek. When you go into an estu estuary for the first time, the smell is completely overwhelming. It is a very powerful, very pungent aroma. However, when you walk into an environment that is like that, or again, even if it's a positive smell, right? You're uh, using the crock pot, or again, it's, it's that time of year when you're baking cookies. You're here baking the cookies and doing all of those things, and you don't think about it at all, but someone new walks into the house and like, oh, wow, it smells delicious in here, and you're not even aware of it. You don't even really smell it anymore. We habituate to that sense of smell. Or dairies, yeah, exactly. Dairies are the exact same way. 
uh, we habituate to smells very, very rapidly. So while we have the ability to perceive them, that ability decreases incredibly rapidly, right? Again, those dogs that are used to track people, they're able to perceive that smell and they can maintain that sense of smell for hours. And that's how they're able to follow that scent or find that scent and be able to be able to work their way around. We don't have that type of long lasting sensitivity to smells. So that's why we get a really bad rap when it comes to that. Is this what people call nose blind? Like if someone's nose Sure, blind? absolutely. Again, that we habituate to it. Uh, Augustina, you guys both are asking a great question. Uh, the, basically, the main reason why it goes away is that for whatever reason, our sense of smell isn't something that we're able to maintain a sensitivity to. Uh, it's the same way uh, like temperature when, you know, or, or uh, you know, I always like to joke the example of my kids, right? Uh, as a newborn baby, a kid whimpers, that baby whimpers a little bit, and you're instantly aware of it and paying attention to it. Now my kids could be sitting right next to me now, right now screaming, dad, 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 dad. And I'd be completely oblivious to it. I don't, I'm not paying any attention to it anymore. We just have this capacity to be able to ignore stimuli. Your nose is still sending signals to your brain saying, hey, I smell this. Hey, I smell this. Hey, I smell this. Hey, I smell this. But our brain doesn't keep that information. It just starts to ignore it and doesn't pay attention to it anymore. And why is a great question. I don't have a good example as to why. Um, it may simply be, uh, like Aubrey pointed out, like a smell of a dairy, or if you think of it from an evolutionary standpoint, if we're a bunch of, uh, you know, humans, humanoid creatures living in a cave together, you know, six or eight of us not bathing, you know, eating dinosaurs or doing whatever else that we're going on, that place is going to reek pretty quickly, right? Anybody who's ever had a teenager knows how rapidly a living space can get pretty stinky. Uh, and yet, obviously, we want to stay in that protective location. So maybe it's maybe the, the reason we habituate so rapidly is to allow us to live together in a social environment without killing each other because we all reek. I, I don't have a good answer as to why, but but it happens. And it's one of the key characteristics that, again, gives us this rap of being having such a bad sense of smell. I have one more question, if that's OK. Yeah, absolutely. For people who are pregnant, does their sense of smell just become more sensitive? Or yes. is it like they have a greater for, sense of smell? For, uh, it, it isn't necessarily that their sense of smell gets better. Their threshold for, they become, it, 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 they're, okay, their sense of smell doesn't improve. It isn't like they're suddenly able to smell things that they weren't able to smell before. But typically what happens uh, is that because of the dramatic changes and hormonal changes that are taking place uh, in their body, their tolerance to abnormal smells can become much lower. So something that wouldn't have bothered them before bothers them now. So it isn't that their sense of smell got better. It's just that they, uh, their, their, their balance in their body is such that they are more easily disturbed by alternate um, stimuli, whether it's sound, whether it's light, whether it's smells, whether it's taste, they can become much more sensitive to those things in how they respond to it. Not that they're able to perceive them better, they just, they respond to them more erratically. Okay, thank you. Yep. All right, that is our sense of smell. And the good news is we pretty much know everything else about our sense of smell. We know that our sense of smell and taste for that matter, we are perceiving chemicals. In this case, these are chemicals that are within the air. We bring them into our nasal cavity. And as we know, we have these nasal concha which produce that turbulence and swirl the air around inside the nasal cavity. So it comes in contact with those nerves that have the chemoreceptors. And I think I have a pretty picture of this. If not, then we will, there it is, perfect. Remember one of the things we talked about and one of the things that was on your 
a 15 point review is that in the, in the olfactory epithelium is one of the places where we have our bipolar neurons. Notice here, we have a centrally located cell body with a single dendrite with chemoreceptors that pick up the chemicals from the air that we breathe. And then a single axon that carries it through the olfactory foramina to the olfactory bulb. So here is that bipolar neuron that we talked about located here inside this sensory structure known as the olfactory epithelium. As I mentioned, one of the super interesting things about this is, as we mentioned, this is one of the places where we find bipolar neurons. But there is something else super interesting about these bipolar neurons. They only last about 30 to 60 days. Does that mean that you only smell, were able to smell for the first two months of your life and then you've been blind to smells ever since then? No. 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 Reproduce them. no, exactly. These are neurons that are capable of dividing and producing new neurons, and they actually replace themselves every month or two. Why? When this was first discovered, this was a huge finding, right? Because what's one of the things that we've learned is that mature neurons are not capable of division. Well, here are mature neurons that are capable of division. Well, if we can figure out how to get these neurons to talk to neurons in the spinal cord, for instance, well, then maybe we can get those neurons to regenerate themselves. And so when this was discovered, this was a huge finding and a massive amount of money and, and effort and energy went into studying these neurons to see what was special about these that is different from every other neuron in your body that we're not able to get those other neurons to regenerate. And so for about 10 years or so, there was a massive, massive increase in uh, research in the olfactory system to try to understand these neurons. And basically the research went nowhere. No one was able to figure out exactly why these neurons are different from the other ones. And at the same time, other people studying stem cells found that stem cells were a much more viable option for being able to make new neurons with stem cells. And so all the money and research has gone into that field and the field of olfaction has uh, decreased dramatically. So we don't know why these neurons are able to divide and replace themselves and others are not, but they do. As we know, there are these bipolar neurons. They communicate with the olfactory bulb which is basically a sensory ganglion. Or more specific, yeah, sensory ganglion. And again, part of the central nervous system. Of course, now notice I said ganglion and central nervous system, those two shouldn't go together. So really it's kind of more of a nuclei. But the key here is that they're multipolar neurons. These multipolar neurons have their many processes where they receive the information from this bipolar neuron, and then their axon goes back towards the brain. And as the axons from this olfactory bulb leave, what structure do they form? Olfactory, olfactory tract. Exactly. They form the olfactory tract, right? And that olfactory tract goes directly to which part of the brain? Remember, our sense of smell is the one that is most closely associated with memory and emotion. That's so limbic system. Limbic system, exactly. So it goes to the limbic system. Right. So notice we'd already talked about all of that stuff. So we know that pathway of carrying that information. And again, as we talked about, that limbic system is, like we said, the area associated with emotion and with uh, memory. Remember, as we also talked about, the sense of smell is the only sensory system that doesn't go through the thalamus. Remember, the thalamus is a relay station for sensory information for all of our senses except smell. Smell is the only one that goes straight back to our limbic system, to that emotion and memory. 
which again is why our sense of smell is the one that triggers emotion and memory so strongly. All right, questions on our olfactory system. All right, let's talk about another one that we kind of talked about, but we need to talk about a little bit more. We talked about this one a lot when we were talking about our cranial nerves, and that is our sense of taste. Inside of our oral cavity, we have uh, primarily on the surface of our tongue, these special sensory structures known as taste buds. Here we see an example of one of these. Uh, here's some actual ones on the surface of the tongue, but I like, we'll stick with the illustration for right now. Notice basically it is a cup-like structure that is open on the end. So chemicals can come inside this little cup-like structure. And when they come inside this cup-like structure, we have these yellow cells lining the surface, which are the specialized cells that uh, are responsible for transduction. They're the ones, they're the ones that have the lock on it, that that chemical is the key, turns the lock, and then it sends a signal to our brain. Over the entire surface of our tongue and oral cavity, we have about 10,000 taste buds. And the taste buds are, not surprisingly, because they're in the oral cavity, constantly being damaged and replaced. Hot coffee, spicy, you know, Chinese food, all sorts of uh, uh, sharp tortilla chips. All of these types of things have the potential to mechanically or chemically damage these taste buds. Smoking is another great example. If you smoke, your taste buds are damaged severely by that. So your sense of taste is, is decreased dramatically. One of the first things that people notice about a week or two after they stop smoking is that their sense of taste comes back incredibly strongly. They have much more subtle abilities to be able to taste things that they couldn't taste before because now that they're stopped smoking after about a couple of weeks, the taste buds have replaced themselves and their sense of taste has come back. Now, like I said, they're primarily located on the tongue, but if you remember, as we talked about when we were talking about our cranial nerves, we are able to perceive some chemical information on the soft palate, on the pharynx, and even on the esophagus. Again, remember those are more general chemical uh, perceptions like pH or certain substrates, right? You're not tasting the difference between vanilla and chocolate necessarily with the roof of your tongue. I mean, the roof of your mouth, it's the tongue that provides that. But uh, we do have some ability, like I said, to perceive acidity or other types of things uh, from other parts of our oral cavity. But like I said, not only are most of the taste buds found on the surface of the tongue, but specifically they're found on finger-like extensions on the tongue. And of course, as we know, the term for a finger-like extension is a papillae. Notice here, we can see three of the four types of papillae that are on the surface of the tongue. The largest of these, what are known as circumvallate papillae, or more and more, you'll see uh, uh, textbooks going with just the term vallate papillae. Oh, and that's spelled wrong, that should be an A. And with these vallate papillae, they are located primarily on the uh, dividing point between the anterior two thirds and the posterior third of the tongue. This posterior third of the tongue is actually covered with your lingual tonsils. This is part of your body's defenses from your uh, outside world. Whereas the anterior two thirds are where we get our sense of taste. And these big, large circumvallate papillae is where most of the taste buds are located. However, we also have these fungiform papillae because they look like little mushroom caps. Let's use a different color for this one. These mushroom caps that stick out and we can see the large bumps that are sticking out on the surface of the tongue spread throughout that are the fungiform papillae. 
These also house taste buds within them as well. Notice the rest of the surface of the tongue isn't just smooth. It has these long pointed narrow papillae known as the filiform papillae. And these filiform papillae do not house taste buds. So they do not provide us with a sense of taste. So what do they do for us? Is it saliva? Not a bad guess. They saliva. There are there is absolutely mucus producing glands within the tongue, but they are deeper in the surface of the tongue. Is it temperature? It can provide some temperature. Absolutely. Anything else? Pressure. Uh, a texture or pressure? I like that. Absolutely, right? Think of it this way. If I took a glass marble, assuming it was clean, so again, it wasn't like I rolled it in you know, dirt or anything like that, and, I, and you put it in your mouth, would, even though there was no taste associated with it, would you be aware of the fact that it was in there? Yeah. Yeah, so the pressure of it, the tactile sensation of it, the fact that it was smooth, all of those are things that we would be able to perceive with that. So it is really a touch receptor that is in the mouth. And it serves one other purpose as well. Anybody here ever seen a cat before? All right, a yes. couple of you. Do any of you actually own cats? Yes, I do. <laughs> Excellent. How does a cat drink water? Is a straw? No. no it, it. It. Yeah, they yeah. stick their tongue out and it gets stuck in the little teeth. Yeah, exactly. They're, they're, have you ever been licked by your cat? Yeah. Oh, it's Absolutely. It, what does that feel like? Scratchy. Sandpaper. Very scratchy. The reason for that is they have very pronounced filiform papillae. And as you guys mentioned, basically they use those big spikes on their tongue to catch the water and draw it up into their mouth. And those tactile receptors are also helped. The reason they're so pronounced is again, I know your cats, you know, get to eat their cat food and, you know, live the luxurious life, but real cats out in the real world typically are eating things that don't want to be eaten. Right. And so by having those long pronounced filiform papillae that helps them to get friction on the structures that they're trying to eat, the bugs or the birds or whatever it is that they're trying to eat that is trying to fight to get out of their mouth, all right? And that's why when they lick you, you get that very, very rough sensation, right? And again, those of you who've been licked by your cat, right? If you've been licked by your boyfriend, it's not the same feeling, right? <laughs> My boyfriend's tongue feels nothing like a cat's tongue, right? But we have those filiform papillae, but they're not nearly as pronounced but they still provide that tactile sensation. They still provide us with that temperature. There's just no sense of taste, no chemical perception that is taking place in that way. Probably the most interesting of these is if you notice on the lateral aspect of the tongue, there are these ridges. These ridges on the lateral aspect, and I think they look even better on this drawing, are what are known as the foliate papillae because they look like the edges of a leaf, like foliage. These foliate papillae, when we're adolescents and infants, they house special uh, receptors, taste receptors for milk fats and milk sugars. Why might it be useful as an infant or as an adolescent to have these milk fat and milk sugar receptors on the lateral aspect of the tongue? For breast milk. Exactly, because their primary food source at that time is milk, breast milk. Absolutely. Now, one of the interesting side effects to this is it is, it is believed that some uh, adolescents, some infants 
uh, these taste receptors on the lateral aspects of the tongue may be sensitive to other things as well. Again, those of you who have adolescents or in you know, adolescents mostly, uh, know that uh, many of them would rather have their left arm ripped off than to eat a sprig of broccoli or eat a mushroom because they think the mushroom is absolutely the most disgusting thing in the whole entire world. Whereas, <laughs> you know, you taste a mushroom and it barely has any taste to it at all, right? You don't see what the big deal is. Well, some of the reasons that some kids may be more hyper picky or hypersensitive to taste may be these foliate papillae. Uh, and this taste receptors that are there. As we age, these go away. So again, that kid that at two absolutely positively hated broccoli, right? By the time they're six and seven, eat it without any problem at all. So it may simply be that some of that pickiness that we see in adolescents in their eating really isn't them just being overly fussy or just because they want to be jerks. It may actually be that they have these extra taste receptors that make them more sensitive to some types of tastes. So take home message is find another reason to beat your kids. Yeah, I'm not saying don't beat your kids. I'm just saying don't beat them because they won't eat their broccoli. And, and All right. Is there a... Um like an average range of when these receptors disappear? That is a great question. Um, I honestly have no idea. That I, I, I don't have any idea. I know typically near the end of adolescence is when they start to, is when they usually are gone. But I, I, I don't know. I don't know if there's an actual trend to that. That's an excellent question. That's a great question. I don't have an answer to. That's awesome but I, I'm sorry, I don't have a good answer for that. I know they go away, but I don't know the timing of it. Okay. All righty, and I think we did this already as well. Oh, here's another big pretty picture of the tongue. What are the five taste sensations? Sweet, sour, salty, umami, bitter. Better. There you go. Excellent. And remember, I think we talked about this already. These are randomly distributed throughout the tongue. Again, you go in that kindergarten class and they always have sweet here in the front and bitter here in the back and salty on the side and all of that. And that's not what your tongue is like because we all have our own taste maps. But, uh, but where these taste receptors are located is different for everyone. All right, so again, not a tremendous amount of new information. We talked about the papillae, that's new, but really everything else we've talked about, uh, we've kind of mentioned before. And of course, if you remember, we've talked about which nerves are involved in this. Remember our primary sense of taste, that from the anterior two thirds of the tongue is um, the, the, the taste, this is what we commonly think of as taste, right? The sweet, the salty, uh, bitter, umami, all of those, that is the facial nerve, that is the primary way. But remember also our glossopharyngeal uh, and our vagus nerve are the ones that are responsible for, you know, the general uh, chemical sensations. And then also this would be the tactile stuff that we talked about as well, right? The, that marble, the heat, stuff like that. And again, notice as we mentioned, this comes into our brainstem, goes to our thalamus, which is of course our relay station for almost all of our sensory system. And then it carries it to the brain. And notice our sense of taste is located on that insula that we talked about. All right. Questions on that? All right, we did that. All right. Let's talk about hearing and equilibrium. Here we see the anatomy of the ear. You have your pinna, the outer structure as we mentioned. And remember, as we mentioned, this is a, a perception of mechanical forces. 
pressure waves in the air come in and hit our eardrum. That's why hearing out here in the air sounds different than when someone's talking to you and your head is underwater, right? If someone's trying to yell at you when you're in the swimming pool or talk to you when you're, I got your head under the water in the bathtub, right? It sounds differently because those pressure waves travel differently in water than they do in air. They push on what we commonly refer to as the eardrum and the fancy term for that is the tympanic membrane. And here they then, those mechanical forces form the vibrations of our auditory ossicles. Three tiniest bones forming the three tiniest synovial joints. And anybody remember the name of the three bones that are found here in the middle ear? Incus, Malleus, and Stapes. Excellent, perfect. They then produce vibrations uh, that of the fluid found here in our inner ear. And if we look closer at our inner ear, this is a structure we talked about before, more coming from the other side. Notice we said, as we saw before, here is that vestibular cochlear nerve that has those two branches going to these two sensory structures. The cochlea, this big spiraled uh, snail looking structure, which houses the organ of cordy, which is where we perceive our hearing. And the vestibule, this structure over here uh, that houses the structures that are responsible for our equilibrium and balance. And notice the key to both of these, they have this blue on the inside. Both of these are fluid filled structures. And these fluid filled structures are what provide us with our sense of hearing and balance. And that is because both of these use we're perceiving mechanical forces. As I mentioned, Vibrations of our stapes produce fluid waves in our cochlea, and they bend some special hair cells that are in there. And those hair cells that are in there basically uh, produce the signals that then go out the vestibular cochlear nerve to our brain, telling us we've perceived sound. Great question. We'll talk about that with equilibrium and balance. Let's do that in a second. Let's finish hearing first, and then we'll talk about equilibrium and balance, and then I'll be able to answer that question for you, Augustina. I have a question, too. Yes, go ahead. We don't have any in these slides, so... Um, All of are... these are pictures straight out of your textbook. Okay. So if you look in your textbook, sensory there. And again, I'm not going to hold you responsible for the anatomy of this stuff. It's two days before the exam. So I just want you to have a basic understanding of this stuff and the, the main concepts behind them. But like I said, this is not going to be a part of the anatomy that you're responsible for the lab exam. Okay. So I mentioned when you hit a tuning fork, basically it compresses the air in some places and spreads the air out in other places and that produces pressure waves in the air. And it is these pressure waves in the air that we perceive as sound. It leads to the flexing and bending of those hair cells, allowing us to perceive it as a mechanical force. And if we increase or decrease the number of waves in a second, that is what we call the pitch. Right. So again, if we notice here, if let's say this was one second in time, notice in this one second of time, there'd be one, two, three, four, five waves, where instead I could go to two waves, or instead I could go to 16 waves during that time. And as we change the number of waves per second, that would affect the pitch. And that is those number of waves per second basically is a measurement known as the Hertz. 
And young, healthy adults typically have a range anywhere between 20 and 20,000 hertz. And the higher the hertz, the higher the pitch. The lower the hertz, the lower the pitch. So when we talk about the pitch, we talk about the uh, frequency. And then the other thing we can do is change the size of the waves. The waves can be smaller or the waves can be bigger. And what is the size of the wave or the amplitude of the wave indicate? What is the amplitude volume. of the sound? Yeah, exactly. The intensity or the volume or how loud it is. And what do we measure the loudness of sound in? If Hertz is what we measure the frequency in, what do we measure the loudness in? It's amplitude. Um, True, it is the amplitude, but what is the unit? Amps. No, not am, so that's a good guess. Come on, I know you guys know. Some of you are Niners game fans. Some of you uh, watch them. Uh, I don't remember. Oh, they lost. Did they beat the, the Seahawks? I don't remember what happened yesterday. I wasn't paying attention. But they were in Seattle, and Seattle's known for their 12th men and for how loud they get. And so you can't, it's impossible to watch a game that takes place in Seattle where they're not talking about the intensity of the sound and what do they measure that in decibels there you go exactly we measure it in decibels absolutely right decibels are the measurement of how loud a sound is notice typically anything above 120 can be instantaneously damaging to your ear uh, however uh, even being uh, sustained to something as low as 70 for a prolonged period of time. So if you happen to live above a noisy restaurant or you work at a noisy restaurant where you're uh, inundated with this loud noise for eight hours a day while you're there, or you live in, uh, you know, by a busy street, that constant inundation of that loud noise can long-term lead to some damage. Right? So that's why, again, when you take the little kids to the concerts, you give them the earplugs. Or when you go into the shooting ring, if you wear uh, the, 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 uh, the ear protectors, those kind of things to protect you from the decibels, the intensity and the damage that it can cause. I, I heard that um, with the decibels, that if you actually get to zero decibels, that your brain doesn't know how to respond to it because it's not used to complete silence. So, true? yes, to an extent, absolutely. That is kind of the point of a lot of the uh, sensory deprivation type of um, experiments okay. uh, or, or activities that you can take where basically you've got the right idea. When, with sensory deprivation, they put you in, uh, you know, the floating in a very salt bath. Uh, so that basically you float uh, and it's at body temperature. So you're not perceiving that. And they basically turn off all the lights. They turn, you know, they, they, they dampen all of the sound and all of those things. And um, yes, without all of that external noise that can lead to an increase in um, internal activity of the brain and, and receptors. And so when you're in pitch, pitch black, sometimes you may, if you're in pitch black for a long period of time, you may think that you perceive images. Uh, if you're, you're, the sound is reduced for a period of time, you may start to have auditory hallucinations. So yes, so a lot of those things uh, can, uh, can sometimes occur when, uh, when deprived of those type of external stimuli, yes. I'm missing a picture here. Let me give me a second to find it. Let 
that. Um, <laughs> This is what I want. All righty. So Notice also at when we talk about damaging our hearing, damaging the hearing occurs in typically with the high frequency sounds first. The reason for this is again, if we were to take that spiraled cochlea and spread it out, here is where that stapes is pounding against the fluid, as we mentioned, making fluid waves. And as those fluid waves come in, they travel along this space. They vibrate that organ of cordy that we talked about that has the hair cells on it. And if you notice the pitches uh, at the higher end, the higher frequency sounds are located closer to the oval window, whereas the lower frequency sounds are further away. So when you're exposed to that gunshot, when you're exposed to that rock music, that causes an increased intensity of those waves, and you're more likely to damage the hair cells up here at the higher frequency sounds. Uh, we'll actually see an example of this. Actually, let's do this now. Um... Where is it? Are you guys hearing anything? No, just your voice. All right, that's not working. Uh, <laughs> All right, let's do it this way then. What about now, you guys hear anything now? No. Nothing? No, we see the screen. So you can't hear anything. No, oh, that's disappointing. All right. So as I mentioned, there is you'll have to do a web search for this stuff on your own. Let's go ahead and end this uh, and find this stuff. But there is, um, as I mentioned, we lose our high frequency sounds as we age. Uh, and so the, the more we age, typically it's the higher frequency sounds that we lose first. Uh, and there was this um, retail store in uh, Finland that realized this 
and they were having a big problem with all these uh, teenage hoodlums loitering outside of their store. So what they started doing is they started playing this high frequency sound of about 14,000 hertz out of their um, speakers out the front. And all of the mature customers like myself aren't able to perceive a sound at that high of a frequency. Uh, whereas all of the youngsters uh, didn't care for the sound, could hear it, and it was irritating to them, so they wouldn't want to loiter outside of the stores. Very, very clever. And then some even more clever people uh, thought, hey, this would be the perfect ringtone uh, for kids so that they could hear when their phone was ringing, but their teachers and their parents couldn't. Uh, so for a, a while there, it was a huge thing on the interwebs, this mosquito, uh, they call it the mosquito ringtone, which again, the kids could hear and parents couldn't. So uh, there are all these types of uh, hearing tests that you guys can look into and try to find uh, that can see and measure what frequencies of sounds you can hear. Uh, and again, that shows you how much you know damage you've done to your, uh, to your cochlea as we've gone through that. All right. All right, so that is our sense of hearing. Any questions on that? Maybe during the break, I'll look to see if I can find um, an example of this that will work. It's hard because I can't hear it, so I'm not, not able to tell what, what I can and cannot hear perceive. But we'll see what I can find. All righty. So that is hearing. Let's finish off, and this will get to Augustina's question about um, motion sickness. And that is our equilibrium and balance. The other place where we have fluids moving is in this special structure known as the vestibule. And the vestibule gives us our equilibrium and balance. And when we're talking about equilibrium and balance, there's basically two types of equilibrium. There is our static equilibrium, and this is basically understanding where our head is in relation to gravity. So again, this is what allows me to stand upright. Right, and, and, and maintain my balances because I always know my relationship with gravity beneath me. However, we also have dynamic. So as I change my head position, I'm aware of how my body is moving in space. Or if you think about, it, as we talked about, if you're in an elevator and that elevator doesn't have any windows and it were to go up and down, uh, you would know whether you were going up or down because of this dynamic equilibrium. And the reason this basically works is because, as I mentioned, these specialized uh, sensory structures are located in fluid. As you are sitting in a car and you hit the gas for the car to go forward, the car instantly starts moving when you hit the grass, but do you, gas, but do you instantly start moving with the car? No, what happens to you when someone hits the gas while you're sitting in the car? You get thrown back. back. Yeah, you get pushed back into your seat. And when someone hits the, the brake, do you stop instantaneously with the cars? <laughs> no. No, you get thrown forward a little bit as well. And that is exactly what is happening with this fluid and these specialized structures here inside of your head. As the fluid moves, it moves these structures. Let's talk about the static equilibrium first. Inside the vestibule are these two structures known as the utricle and the saccule. And they contain hair cells like in our ear for hearing. But there's also this big, huge gelatinous mass that sits on top of them, a huge, big jello jiggler that sits on top of them. And that jello jiggler has all of these calcium rocks known as otoliths. So I remember when grandma used to tell you all the time that you had rocks in your head. She was right. You have these rocks in your head called otoliths that basically put a lot of weight on that jello jiggler. And so what happens is as you move your head, those rocks pull on the jello jiggler and tell you your relationship with gravity, right? We got a pretty picture here that shows this example. Here's our jello jiggler, here's that rock and those hair cells. And so when your head is upright, gravity is pulling it straight down and the hairs aren't moved at all. But notice what happens when he tilts his head back. When he tilts his head back, gravity pulls on that rock and it bends the hair cells 
and you've perceived the fact that you've now gone from your head being parallel to the ground to being tilted. And so it's really the movement of these rocks inside your head that basically tell you where you are in space in relation to gravity. However, how you move through space, as I mentioned, uh, our dynamic equilibrium is because of these special sensory structures that are contained in the fluid. And remember, as I mentioned, as you start to say, for instance, rotate in your chair, as you rotate in your chair, the fluid starts to move first. And as the fluid moves, it pushes on those sensory structures. And so as the fluids move and push on those, you get the perception of dynamic movement. You can actually experience this without spinning yourself in a chair. Here are the three things you need. You need a willing participant, you need a towel, and you need a bucket. If you have those three things, put your willing participant on the floor, laying on their side, and put the towel underneath their head. Then what you're going to do is you are going to pour warm, not hot, <laughs> but warm water into slowly into their ear. And as you pour that warm water into their ear, it is going to increase the movement of that fluid. The warmth heats up the fluid and the fluid moves more. And what's going to start to happen is they're going to start to make eye movements called saccades. If you ever watch someone, next time you're in the car, okay, make sure you're in the passenger side, don't do this while you're driving, and you need someone behind you. So while you're sitting in the passenger side, look at the person behind you as they're looking out the window. As you watch someone looking out the window, what happens is as they're watching the world go by, they typically or their eye doesn't stay in one location. Typically what happens is their eye will lock onto an object, follow that object slowly as it spans by, and then they'll come back to a forward object again and then span and forward eye and span. That kind of eye movement is called a saccade. Well, if you start pouring warm water into their ear, they will start to get the feeling that they're spinning. And when they're spinning, they will start to make those saccades with their eyes. Now, the reason you have the bucket there is because as Augustina matched up, the problem becomes if you start to get a disparity between what your eyes are telling you and what your ears are telling you, your ear is telling you you're spinning. Your eyes are telling you that you are not spinning. And what happens is when there is that confusion of information, that's what causes motion sickness. It works the other way as well. You're at that big IMAX theater and your ears are telling you that you're sitting perfectly straight, but your eyes are telling you that you're participating in a dog fight going through right, the Death Star. And again, there is that confusion between the movement that your eyes are telling you and what your ears are telling you. And that confusion of information is what causes motion sickness. Notice motion sickness, when you get it in the car, never happens to the driver because the driver knows where the car is going. The person who's sitting in the back seat, who sees the world going by and may anticipate that they're going to swerve a little bit and don't, or anticipate that they're going straight and they take a left. It's that, again, that confusion between what you're expecting the movement to be and what the movement is and what you're seeing and what you're thinking is going to be going on that causes that motion sickness. Vertigo can be a similar type of experience. There's a little bit more psychological component to it, again, but it is, again, a disparity between what the expected movement is and what the actual movement or confusion between sensory information. So again, uh, you've got the visual of being up at the top of that building and the fear, because again, there's more emotional associated with vertigo as well, of the potential of falling or the sensation of falling that looking down like that can cause and those types of things can cause that sense of vertigo. So it is similar to motion sickness, but it is more emotionally uh, related. I have a question. Yes. So I recently found... Um 
because I get super motion sick in the back of a car. It's horrible. Um, but I found recently that they came out with these glasses that have um, like liquid in a circle. So you can physically see the movement of the vehicle. So then you can actually not get motion sickness because your vision and <clears throat> your hearing, they're all going to be together on what's happening in the movement of the vehicle. That's awesome. And that makes sense. I have, I've not heard of those. I'm not familiar with the technology, but uh, notice the keyword you said you get motion sick in the back seat. Obviously, when you're driving, it's not an issue. But even for some people being in the front seat, again, when you can see the world, you're better to anticipate, able to anticipate when they're going to stop or when they're going to turn or when they have to swerve to go around the puppy and all those things. And that and you're better able to anticipate the movements. And so, yeah, I could see where being able to see those movements would help with that. So that's uh, that's really cool. Because the problem is, even if you close your eyes, you still have expectations of what could happen and could not happen. And again, you're not able to pair that up. But if you were looking at fluids that were moving the same way the car would be, I, I again, I'm not familiar with the technology. I don't know if it works, but theoretically, I could see where that could potentially help. Do you actually own them? Did you get those? I, I do not know. I saw them on a TikTok and I kind of want to buy them. <laughs> I, 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 I've not heard of them. I don't, I can't, I can't vouch for the validity of them. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, if you can't drive or if you can't sit in the front seat, then if something like that could work, uh, then, uh, then yeah. 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 Many people, again, Augustina, exactly. When you, when you're driving, you have the control, there's no more confusion. And so you don't have that issue the same way, but, uh, but yeah, so if you can't drive and if you can't be in the front seat, then I'm all for anything that can help. Excellent. All right. Any other questions on this? Yes. I have no idea. I, I haven't heard of that one. I know uh, that they say, for instance, if you feel like you're going to be, uh, if you're going to throw up, that smiling can help to suppress that sensation. I have never heard the lemon peel one. That's not one I'm familiar with. I don't, I don't have an answer for you for that. Yeah, they always say like when you're like motion sickness and you're gonna throw up to smell lemon peel because the smell I don't, I don't know what it does but yeah they always say like smell lemon peel or chew gum because the mint and like the smell of the mint is supposed to do something I, I don't know exactly what it does but hmm. that's what I always hear <laughs> well I mean uh, yeah I don't I, like I said for instance when we're in the classroom and we're it's going to be a cadaver day or when we're doing a dissection for those people who are more sensitive to smells one of the things we recommend is to bring something like Vicks Vapor Rub where you can put it under your nose and then that powerful smell uh, is able to basically mask the smells of the other things so I mean I could see where the uh, again lemon mint uh, that Vicks Vapor Rub all of those are things that are very powerful smells but I'm not sure why a powerful smell would would help with motion sickness. I'm not saying that it doesn't. I'm just saying that I, I don't know the mechanism for that. And, I, and that one I've never actually heard. So I, I, don't, I don't have a good answer for that one. It's interesting. But again, as someone, as you mentioned, uh, you get really, really sick in the car. So it doesn't surprise me if, uh, if you've learned about many tricks like that. Does, have you used that one? Does that one work for you? I know you said you, got, you get very motion sick. Have you tried the lemon peel one? I've tried it, but I don't, I don't think it helps. Like the only thing that helps are like those patches and like uh, those like, like doctors can prescribe medicine if it's really bad. Yeah. Uh, things like Dramamine and stuff like that. I know, uh, again, uh, it is similar to um, for motion, uh, morning sickness for pregnancy. And I know there are like pressure things that you can get on your wrist, uh, ginger, things like that, that are supposed to help. And I know those things can help as well. But I, th I think, uh, as you mentioned, I think a lot of it tends to be, uh, it'll work for some people, but not necessarily for everybody. So it's, you know, find the one that works for you. Or like you said, just drive. 
you get to be the one that drives all the time. Of course, the only problem with that is then you're always the designated driver and it's harder to drink. So it's a, but then if you drink, you're more likely to throw up. So it's a, it's a vicious cycle. <laughs> all righty. Excellent. Yeah. Um, I was just going to mention oh. that the Vicks Vapor Rub, mm -hmm. that stuff works magic in the medical field. Yeah. It's your best friend. <laughs> yeah, because it masks all smells. So yeah. Yeah, I used to have one in my drawer just in case it was, yeah. Yeah, some things you just can't unsmell in life. <laughs> there you go, exactly. And so it can be very light masking for that, absolutely. Yeah. Yep, yep. All right, excellent. All right, the last one we have to cover uh, is the eye, and we'll probably actually spend the least amount of time on this one, but let's go ahead and uh, take our last break at this point. Uh, and uh, take a quick break, 15 minute break, come back at 930 and we'll finish up with all the visual stuff. So we will restart at 930 and I will start the recording at that time. So I will see you guys in 15 minutes. Let's see if you guys are here. We can hear it. All right, so everybody could hear that? Yes. All right, let's see what the yeah. rest looks like. Okay. Everybody hear that? Yes. Okay. Everybody hear that? Yes. yes. Was there a sound there? Did anybody hear the 15,000? Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> Did anybody hear a sound? Let's go back. I don't know. Can you do it again? Yeah, I missed it. <laughs> go back a little bit. <laughs> yeah, all right, let's try this one. This is 15 hertz, 15,000. Did anybody hear anything? No. no I didn't. That's not okay. good. <laughs> I didn't. Nobody heard anything? No. Well, or at okay. least I didn't. I don't know how. Maybe maybe it's a translation thing. So I, obviously, if this keeps going up, we probably won't hear any of the rest of these. I didn't hear anything, but I normally can't hear at that high range. Anyone hearing anything? Mm -mm. Okay. Well, so it, again, again, the point of this is that we all have different ranges of hearing and it tends to go down as we age. So you guys will have to, uh, again, I don't know how much of this is the translation through, uh, you know, Zoom and all of that, but if you do a hearing test or <coughs> mosquito sound search, you should be able to sound, found some of these sounds and be able to, uh, be able to experience that for yourself as well. All right, let's go ahead and get rid of that. Let's save that one. All right. So as I mentioned, the last sense we have to talk about is the sense of sight, our vision. And again, as I mentioned by trade, I'm a visual neuroanatomist, so I am completely biased, but at the same time, the eye is indeed the most important organ in the body, or at least sensory organs, although I would argue organ period, uh, even more important than the heart. 70% uh, of the sensory receptors are located in the eye. So 70% of the information we are getting from the world around us comes in through the eye. And each optic nerve that we talked about, that second cranial nerve, has over 1 million nerve fibers in it. Over 60% of our cortex is involved in processing visual information in some way. Visual information is an incredibly, incredibly important system. We've already looked at the retina before. Remember, we looked at these three layers of cells. We have the uh, ganglion cells that are located here that there are just a few of, and I say just a few, but these are the ones whose million axons 
make up our optic nerve. That should tell you that you have billions of bipolar neurons and trillions of these photoreceptors. And these photoreceptors, all I'm really circling are their nuclei. These photoreceptors have these big long hairs that stick out of it that are what are responsible for perceiving the light. And remember, as we mentioned, we are di diurnal organisms. So remember at the back of our eye, we have this pigmented epithelium to absorb most of the light, which allows us to uh, find discrimination of vision. Here we have an illustration basically showing this same thing. Again, remember this is where we found our bipolar neurons with one ganglion receiving information from the photoreceptors, one axon sending it to the ganglion cells, and then the ganglion cells make our optic nerve and leave. Now notice there is one interesting thing about this organization. Notice the photoreceptors are actually located at the very back of the eye. So the light has to pass through all of these structures to get to it. Notice also that to, for these axons of the ganglion cells to leave and form the optic nerve, there is a small portion of our retina that has no photoreceptors. And what do we call that small portion of the retina that doesn't have photoreceptors in it? Come on, I know you know. There, there you go, Mitch, your blind spot. Absolutely. Most of you have done this blind spot test. Now, when I'm looking at the screen right now with both eyes, then why don't I see two big black holes in the screen where the, I don't have any photoreceptors. How come when I look at the screen, everything looks continuous? Yeah, well, part of it is the crossing, but also do you think that the blind spots from both eyes are exactly in the same location? So you don't get any information from there at all? No. No, information crosses, absolutely. So the blind spot for one eye is in a different spot for the blind side of the other eye. So we're at least getting information from one eye for all portions of what we're seeing. However, when you close one eye, does a big hole open up in your visual field then? Yes. Really? When you close one eye, is there suddenly a big gaping black spot that you see? No. No. And the reason for it, it's <laughs> off to your side and your brain actually tricks you into okay. filling in that information. Most of us have looked at and taken one of those blind um, spot tests. Basically, it's a strip that has a plus on one side and a circle on the other side. And basically what you do is uh, for this one, as you were looking at this here, and it's, it won't be the right gauge. So if you closed your uh, right eye and stared at this plus with the, well, actually, if you get close enough, you can make it go away. Um, if you stare at the, at the plus with your left eye and then move your head and move this board around in space, you can actually get that circle to disappear. And the reason that occurs is because for the most part, our brain fills that information in and is usually pretty good at it. It's one of the tricks that our nervous system does to make what we see our reality. And again, here we have some fancy examples of that as well. This used to be a lot easier to explain because uh, in ancient times, there were things called cameras. And cameras weren't uh, some digital devices you kept in your pocket and were also able to text and emote and play games on and things like that. There were these boxes and these boxes had a little hole in them. And in the back of the box, you put film. And film was this light sensitive material. And basically the box had a special contraption on it that would very briefly open up a space known as an iris and allow some light in. And that light would hit that film on the back of the box and imprint on that light sensitive film. And then the iris would close and you'd advance the film 
and then the process would continue. And basically your eye works exactly like one of those ancient cameras. Light comes off of some object and radiates off. It is the job of your cornea and your lens to refract and bend that light and project it into a single location on your retina so that it is visible and clear. We see that very image. If, however, your retina is too curved or your lens is too curved, then your focal point becomes in front and things are foggy. If the, it doesn't curve it enough, then the focal point will be behind the retina and the image will be fuzzy. So if we don't, if your lens and cornea don't bend the light enough or don't, or bend the light too much, how do we fix that? Yeah, basically we put a second lens in front of this, which bends the light even more and brings it back into focus. That's the whole point of glasses is to compensate for too much curvature or too less curvature to your cornea and things along those lines. And again, that bending of the light is a fancy term for that is refraction. And the majority of that occurs in the cornea. We know this now because if you don't want to wear glasses, one of the things that you can have done is you can get someone to hit your cornea with thousands of little uh, laser shots that burn and scar and destroy, destroy small portions of your cornea. And while destroying small portions of your cornea, it changes the curvature of your cornea to try to bring the light back into focus. And what do we call that process of destroying your cornea for vanity's sake? Come on, I know at least some of you know somebody who's had it. How about LASIK surgery? LASIK surgery yes, is that- <laughs> you know, exactly, you know what I was talking about. Exactly, that LASIK surgery is basically destroying cells in your cornea to change the shape of the cornea so that it brings it into focus. Of course, remember your eye continues to grow through your life, so that's not good. that is not a long-term solution, it is a short-term solution. And remember also that the cells of your cornea don't divide. So the amount that you have when you are born are the same that you have for your entire life. So if you damage some of them with the LASIK uh, laser, then those don't come back. We then have this rubber ball on the inside of our eye made up of this rubbery crystalline matrix known as a lens. And we have muscles connected to little strings that touch to that rubber ball and change the curvature of that lever little ball. And that allows us to change our accommodation, change our focus. Because if you're looking at, from, at something very far away, the light pretty much that comes into your eye is all parallel. So only a little bit of curvature is needed to bring it into focus. However, if you're looking up at something up close, the light is very bent coming into the eye. And so we have to curve it even more to bring it back into focus. And so this ability to change the shape of this rubber ball is accommodation. And it allows you to look up close and read a book and look off in the distance and see someone playing ball. Of course, like all rubber balls, if you have a rubber ball and I bend, I squish it and I let go, what happens? goes back up. Yeah, it goes back to its original shape. But if I squish that ball 10,000 times, after the 10,000th time, is it necessarily going to fully bounce back to its original shape? No. No. So one of the things that happens to us as we get older is our rubber ball becomes a little less flexible. And so now when I need to bend the light more to bring it into focus so I can read my phone, 
Am I able to get my ball back into the right shape to be able to read that image? No. So no. then I spend about a year doing a trombone thing, trying to read my phone until finally you give in and you get your reading glasses, right? Presbyopia, basically getting old. This loss of accommodation, loss of elasticity of your lens decreases your ability and uh, it happens to the best of us. The other interesting thing about the way the light works is notice that as this image shows, a light source that is on the uh, lower part of the world, when it is refracted by the light, it comes to the upper part of the retina. So when we look at an object in space, things that are in the bottom of the world are in the top of the retina. Things that are in the top in the real world are in the bottom of a retina. So the images are upside down. And the same way it works for up and down, does it work the same for left and right? No, yes. Yeah. Things that are on the left in the outside world are in the right in our retina. So not only are the images upside down, but the images are also reversed. So why when you look in a mirror, is it not upside down? It's only left and right. It is. Well, no, but so you're, you're talking about a different thing. You were talking about the reflection of light from the mirror coming back to yourself. Right. You are seeing yourself. However, the image that you're seeing on your retina the image of you on your retina is upside down and reversed. So uh -huh. whatever you're looking at in the real world, whatever you think you're seeing on the real world, on your retina, the image is reversed. This was something that uh, neuroscientists thought were really, really interesting. Remember we talked about in the 70s, they used to torture uh, freshmen. Uh, and we talked about, you know, the, uh, the locking them in the rooms for seven days, or we talked about... Uh, um, we talked about the prisoner's dilemma at Stanford. Well, one of the interesting things they were interested in is they took some of these freshmen and they wear, made them wear prism glasses. And basically what these prism glasses did is they took the real world images and they turned them upside down and backwards. So that when they were presented to the retina, they were oriented the correct way. So the same th way things were in the real world, things were on the retina. And so not surprisingly, when your brain is used to seeing the world upside down and backwards, and you show it to it upside down and backwards, then the whole world now looks upside down and backwards. Left is right, right is uh, left, up is down and down is up. We were talking about motion sickness before. Can you imagine the type of motion sickness you would expect when you turn your head to the right, but you see the world going left? When you turn your head up, but you see the world going down? Right. Not only can you probably barely get out of bed without throwing up, are you going to be able to go to class? Are you going to be able to drive a car? No, absolutely not. And so not surprisingly, these people really, really struggled with it for about two days. And after two days, suddenly something flipped and suddenly they saw the world normally. This was a huge remarkable finding. What this tells us is that the world is not hard mapped in our brain or hard mapped on our retina. We get the information and we process it. We make sense of it. And so even though the world looked upside down and backwards to them, eventually their brain got used to them and suddenly they saw perfectly normal. And they could walk and they could eat, feed themselves and they could drive a car, although I don't think they were allowed to, but they could have been able to. Really, really cool, really, really awesome. And then they did that for a couple of weeks. The experiment ended and they took the prism glasses off. And guess what happened when they took the prism glasses off? They're confused. <laughs> yeah, the whole world was upside down and backwards again. And there were many, many a panicked call to the postdocs who were working on this research going, oh my God, I'm broken. Luckily, after two or three days, people's vision went back to normal again. And so eventually they were able to see correctly. But I have to imagine they were truly panicked for those first two or three days until their brains fixed themselves again. 
this illustrates two things that obviously like a camera, the images is upside down and backwards when the image is formed on our brain, but our perception of vision is more than just light. We have to take that light, but we also have to make sense of it. And so there's a tremendous amount of processing that goes on. Our blind spot, this refraction of the light, all of these things are things that our brain has to fix, including our perception of color. We have two different types of receptors. In fact, if we cheat and go back to this image here, there are two different types of receptors, photoreceptors. There are the rods and there are the cones. Rods provide just intensity of light. Basically how much light there is, it's black and white. Where it is our photoreceptors, the cones that provide a perception of color. However, our perception of color is a population effect. Basically, we have three types of cones that perceive three different wavelengths of light. Let's go back to this image here. Notice we have blue cones, green cones, and red cones. So let's say, for instance, we are looking at a bright red light. Notice with that bright red light, it will make the red cones fire at a moderate amount. Our green cones fire just a tiny bit. And do our blue cones fire at all? No, blue cones don't fire at all. So when our red cones are firing a moderate amount, green cones a little bit and blue cones not at all, we know we're seeing something red. Notice conversely, if we're seeing something green, it's like that's a little darker down around here. Notice with this one, our green cone fires a lot our red cone, a moderate amount, our blue cone, a little bit. And so it is these population effects, not just what one cone is doing, but what all three cones are doing together that tell us what a color is. And that happens here in the retina. So notice again, it's not just about seeing one thing. It's about taking this information and processing it. And our brain is really, really good. Again, think about what's going on here. You have two flat surfaces inside of your two eyes. The two retinas are two flat surfaces. Yes, absolutely, Avicenia. Let me, let me get to that in a second. Um, two flat surfaces that basically are taking all the information in around you. And by taking all this information around you, you perceive the world around you. A three-dimensional world off of these two-dimensional structures. And our brain is really, really, really good about doing that. But it's not perfect. There are times when the processing breaks down, where the processing doesn't work, where the system breaks, right? Where the matrix is exposed. And what do we call that when the matrix is exposed? What do we call when our visual system breaks down, the tricks it uses to understand the world break down? What do we call that? Like I said, it's not a glitch in the matrix. Come on, I know you know the term for it, even if you don't know the term. There you go, exactly. We call them illusions. And when we're talking about visual illusions, they're optical illusions. An illusion is basically what we use 
when there's a breakdown, I should say, an illusion, let's describe it that way. An illusion is basically a breakdown in the normal processing a normal processing system of the brain. And we look at illusions because they're fun and interesting, but for us, they're most important because they tell us how the brain works. Let's talk about a really simple example. Now, again, I'm usually doing these in the classroom, so I don't know how well this will work here, but for this one, you may need to get a little bit further away from your screen. As you get a little bit further away from your screen, as you're looking at this, what is actually here is a white screen with black boxes. But as you move a little bit farther away from the screen, is that all that you see? What else do you notice? You see little dots, almost like shadows. Yeah, exactly. You'll see these kind of gray circles that are will form at the intersections. Now, if you look at one in particular, do you see it? So if you're staring at this one right here, do you see that gray circle right there? No. No, but you see it in all the surrounding ones. And exactly, if you're close to it like I am and, and like Augustine is, you not only see circles at the center, but you see gray lines in between as well. This is what is called the Hermann's grid. And what this tells us about our visual system is actually our visual system doesn't care about light. I know that sounds like a really silly thing to say, but it's true. Think about this. If you were staring at a big blank white wall, that would be a tremendous amount of light information that was coming into your brain. However, would that be really important? Would it be important to be perceiving a big, huge, blank, white wall? No. No. So do you want your, your brain and your eye using a massive amount of information, a massive amount of energy, just to tell you that there's a big, white, blank wall? No. No. What you care about is where the door is in that wall. Our visual system is specialized to detect, oops, can't use black, is specialized to detect edges. An edge, a break in the light, a difference in the light is much more important than just light by itself. And that's what's happening. When you're staring here, off to the side over here, there is an edge here, and 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 those edges are all enhanced. But notice right here, there's no edges really. And so this region right here where there's no edges, we don't care as much about that information. And so our retina gets less excited about that information than it does for the edges. And so as a result of it, because we're not as excited by it, we don't get stimulated as much by it, less action potentials are produced. And the more action potentials, the brighter something is. So with fewer action potentials, we see it as a little bit darker, a little bit grayer. So this tells us that, again, we don't care about light, we care about edges. All right, I'm gonna give you 10 seconds when I turn this image on and there are, it's a similar grid to the one we saw before, but there are white circles and black circles at the intersections. And you need to count how many white and how many black ones there are. And you've got 15 seconds to do it. Ready, go. All right, how many black circles are there? Zero. <laughs> well, you don't, you're telling me you don't see any? No, when I look at it. Yeah, as you move your eyes around the image, yeah. you see white and black spots. And basically where you're looking is white and where you don't look, is they're black dots, right? We yeah. knew this illusion is similar to the Herman grid that we just saw, but we don't actually know the mechanism by which this one works. We know this is also related to the edge detector, 
right? Clearly something is going wrong with our visual system here, or we're breaking some illusion here as well, but we don't actually know, we don't understand the mechanism. We know it's related to that edge detector, but we don't actually know how this one works. I don't like this one. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get back. I didn't forget your question, Augustina, before, right? Notice those last two we talked about, the Hermann grids just dealt with the intensity of light involved more of the rods. But as we were talking about, you need three sets of cones to be able to perceive light. In some individuals, they will be missing one of those three cones. And if they miss, or if they're lacking one of those three cones, they lose some of the ability to be able to discriminate colors. And as Augustina pointed out, we typically call that someone who is colorblind. Now, on the screen here, we have a bunch of colored dots. Do you notice anything uh, interesting about these uh, groups of colored dots? They have no. numbers. Do all of them have numbers inside of them? Yes. yes. Okay, does anybody not see a number inside of all of them? And there aren't too many males left in here in the classroom. So it doesn't surprise <laughs> me because colorblindness is much more common in males. Absolutely. There are numbers inside of all of them. But in particular, someone who has red green colorblindness will not be able to see these four numbers. These two, anybody can be able to see. But these other four, people aren't able to perceive them if they're colorblind. Now, I, this has never happened to me, but I had an instructor who was giving this lecture, uh, God, many years ago, about 10 years ago, in a class like this. And during the middle of the class, one of the students raised his hand and said, I don't see numbers in all of those. And it was right there in his anatomy and physiology class in college that he found out he was colorblind. How can you possibly go the first 20 years of your life and not know that you're colorblind? that's all you know. Right. You don't know anything different. Describe red to somebody else. Describe red to somebody else. <laughs> See that? Right? But again. Blood. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> well, but again, yeah. what does that mean? Right. But can someone who's colorblind drive? If you can't tell the difference between red and green, how do you know when to start and when to stop with your car? What, the like what order is it in? Yeah, when the top light goes on, that's when you stop. When the bottom light goes on, that's when you go. Yeah, you would think that, like, you would know even by the stoplight. It's like, okay, you go at green. Well, what's green? Well, the bottom one. Yeah, oh, yeah exactly. Guess, yeah. So, again, how do you describe <laughs> green? The stop <laughs> sign is red, but, you know, which is the same as the top light. But, again, if your perception of red isn't different, then how do you... You know, again, it's 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 impossible to describe a color to somebody else. And so it's not surprising. Yeah. Someone else may have noticed about it. Maybe they're often their their socks don't match. Right. They may not have the best fashion sense. But uh, but yeah, he made it all the way to 20 years of age and was not aware of the fact that he was colorblind. So what do they see, like gray and blacks and white? Or? So they will just see. So it, for two, for three, for six and for four, they just see a bunch of irregular size. I mean, there's variations in color. Notice there's not just one green colored dot, right? So they'll see mm -hmm. variations in the colors of the dots, but they won't see the number. Those will Aren't just there colorblind color glasses that you could buy? There are glasses that can help to diverge the colors more to make it easier to perceive the differences in color. Uh, depends on the type of colorblindness that you have. There's not just one type of colorblindness with three uh, different types of uh, of um, cones, there are different. You know, if you're lacking one type of cone, you can have yellow, blue, color blindness, red, green, which is the most common. Uh, there can be others as well. All right. So, remember, we talked about how color is a population effect. One of the best ways to see this is with something like this: this after image. I'm going to show you an image at the center of the screen. At the center of the screen, there's going to be an X. I need you to stare at that center X for 30 seconds. And then after you stare at that for 30 seconds, the image will go away and something else will be there instead. All right, ready? So stare at this image for 30 seconds, stare at the X at the center and start now. 
Try not to blink. Try not to move your eyes. Just try to stay focused on that X that is in the center of the field of view. Halfway there. Keep going, almost there. What do you notice now? Anyone see it anything? The, it was the flag. It was normal red, white, right. and blue. Yeah, and if you blink your eyes, you can kind of get it to come back. Yeah, you can see the lines. I see the lines. Yeah, the lines. Right. Well, so let's, let's think about what's happening here. Remember, as we mentioned, we have three cones, a red cone, a green cone, and a blue cone. And if you notice, with this yellow color, yellow color, if we were to, let's cheat and actually go all the way back. Notice with a yellow colored light, that yellow colored light stimulates the red cones, stimulates the green cones, but doesn't stimulate the blue cone at all. So what's happening right here is that we've got a red cone, we've got our green cone, and we've got our bloom cone. And while you're staring at the X, the yellow box is hitting a portion of your retina and your red cones and your green cones are firing a bunch of action potentials. They're firing game bucksters because they're stimulated by that yellow light, whereas the blue is not stimulated at all. And the problem, as we've learned, when cells fire a lot of action potentials, they get tired. That term we talked about before, they habituate. And when they habituate, they get less and less likely to fire. So now, when the image goes away, here, now white light is hitting that same part of the retina. And when that white light hits the same part of the retina, white light has all the colors of the wavelength in it. So all of our cells should be firing gangbusters. And indeed, our blue one goes crazy to the white light. However, our red and blue should be going gangbusters, but they're tired. So they only fire a little bit. And when our blue fires a lot and green and red fire only a little bit, what color do we perceive? Blue. Notice it's the same way here. Here, blue cells are getting super tired so that when the blue goes away, the red and the green fire gangbusters, and that tells us that we're looking at red. So notice this is basically what we're doing is we're making the cells tired in the retina. And since it's a population effect, we get this because of the difference in the firing rate. Now, this effect occurs in the eye. So if I stared at the image with my left eye and then I looked at the white screen with my white right eye, would I see the American flag in its normal colors? No. No. However, what's really cool is the same way that we have a color after effect, we have a motion after effect. Let's take a look at this one. I'm gonna go ahead and mute this because the sound isn't important for this. So again, here's another one. Watch this image. So again, you're gonna stare at the center of the screen and when the video end looks around the room or one of the best things to do is to look at your hand. Like it says, try not to blink, try not to look away. So stare at the eye in the center of our field of view. 
You're going to do this for about 30 seconds. No, I'm not trying to uh, hypnotize you. Almost done. Again, try not to blink. Try to keep your eyes still. I swear it'll end. Pretty sure it'll end. There you go. Now, as you look at your around the room or you look at your hand, what do you notice? What happened? It's moving. Yeah, it's moving. Why? What's going on here? Well, what's happening here is what is called, oops, I didn't mean to close that. The waterfall effect. Uh, again, you may have noticed this before if you've ever gone to like Yosemite or one of those types of sites and you stare at the waterfall for a prolonged period of time, then what you may actually notice is the rock right next to the waterfall looks like it's traveling up. The reason for that is what you just experienced is a motion after effect. The same way that our cells for color get tired of firing, our cells for motion get tired of firing. So if you're constantly seeing a left motion and then you see a stable image, the left motion cells are tired. And so the right ones fire more and you perceive a right movement. Or if you're watching the waterfall constantly going down, those down get tired. And so when you look at the static image of the rock, it looks like the rock is going up. What's cool about this one is this one takes place in the brain. So on this one, you can actually watch the spiral with your left eye and then look at your hand with the right eye and you'll see all the twirling because this one takes place in the brain. All right. <clears throat> most of our illusions are because of our understanding of the world and how the world works. Normally at this point, you know, we're standing in the classroom and I ask you if you can see my legs. So I'll ask you, can you see my legs? No. No, because no. I don't have legs? I hope not, or I hope no. so, wait, I hope not. <laughs> No, it's, be, know, it's because but... I'm on camera. I'm on, you know, obviously you're only seeing the top half of me. If I'm in the classroom, you wouldn't see my legs right now because I'm standing behind the desk. Now, the fact that you can't see my legs, you don't suddenly think, oh my God, he doesn't have legs. You understand how the world works. You understand in your brain that the desk is closer to you than I am. And so it is blocking my legs. So the fact that you can't see my legs mean I am behind the desk and the desk is closer to you than I am. We understand how the world works, right? We see this all the time with the moon. When you got that big, huge harvest moon, it always looks best when it is close to the horizon. That full moon isn't nearly as impressive when it's up at the apex of the sky. Now here we have two circles. And of course, are these circles the same size? Yes or no? No. They well, in this picture? Yeah, in these yeah. two pictures, yes, yes. are these two the same size? Yes. yes. Do you perceive them as being the same size, though? No. In real life? Yeah. yeah. So, no. As yeah. you're looking at them in real life right now, no. they look the same size. No. No, you guys all know this is a trick. You all know that they're the same size because you've all seen illusions like this, and they are indeed the same size. But when you look at them, they don't appear to be the same size. And that's because you understand how the world works. The amount of light that is hitting your eyes from both of these are the same. So the dots are identical on your retina. However, the difference is here, we see horizon lines. And those horizon lines tell us that whatever we're looking at is really far away. 
And because it's really far away, our brain automatically makes it look bigger. Whereas here, when the moon is at the apex, there's no perspective. So a small dot of light is hitting our eye. And so we see it as a small dot. And notice it's not just for just the moon. What do you see in this image? Too creepy. Um, yeah, uh, two, doll? two creepy monsters. Know. Yeah, something. Yeah. One creepy monster chasing another creepy monster. All right. Which one's bigger, the top one or the bottom one? Top one. Clearly, absolutely. Way, way bigger, right? They are the exact same size. Even when I show you that, does it look like they're the same size? No. No. Right, We're totally fooled by this, by our understanding of the world. And it doesn't just work for creepy monsters. Here, what you see are two normal looking people and one tiny little midget. Of course, what's the trick? The tiny little midget is the exact same image as this one back here. This one looks like a normal sized person. This one looks like a midget for no other reason than where the image was put in the picture. We understand perspective. We understand how the world works, where things that are farther away are bigger than they appear on our retina. So that is why this guy looks normal and this one looks funny. That's why this one looks huge and this one looks tiny. It's because just where they were put in the picture. When you talk to policemen, Right. One of the worst evidence you can have in a case is eyewitness reports. Because 10 people can watch the exact same event and perceive it completely differently. Why? Because they have different expectations. Right. I'm going to show you a, a picture here of a checkerboard. Which of these two squares? is darker, A or B? A. Does anybody think B is darker? Does anybody think that A and B are the same color? I mean, I wanna say that the same color because it's an illusion, but my right. eyes- you know what to expect. You know what to expect. You know they. I'm asking the question. It's an illusions lab. You know they have to be the same color. But is there any way that they're the same color? Right now, no. Yeah. What about now? Yeah. Yeah. They are exactly the same color. How the hell can that be? How can B be the same color as A? What's happening here? Is it the shadow? Exactly. We understand how the world works. If you and your friend are walking down the street and the shadow of a tree suddenly covers your friend's face, do you no longer recognize them? Who are you? Where'd my friend go? No. Right? No. We understand that when things are in a shadow, the shadow makes them darker. So our brain fixes it. So your brain sees box B, sees that it's in a shadow. And so it says, all right, this is, uh, even though I'm seeing it at one wavelength of color, I need to make it lighter because I know that what I'm expecting is something that's going to be dark. So I have to make it lighter. Even with the bars, it's really hard to see that these are the same color but they absolutely are because we know how the world works. All right, like I said, I'm gonna show you a picture of an old lady in a fur coat. Anybody see an old lady in a fur coat? Mm -hmm. Yes. Excellent. I'm gonna show you a picture of a young woman in profile. Anybody see a young woman looking away from the screen? Yeah. Now, of course, what's the big deal on these two pictures? They're the same. They're the exact same pictures, exactly. 
These are what are known as ambiguous pictures. These are pictures that when you show it to 100 people, 50 people see the old woman first, 50 people see the young woman first. Wait, I can't see that. I can't see the old, yeah. Okay, so let's go, uh, okay, excellent. <laughs> so all. let's do this. Here is the old woman. This is the old woman's left eye. This is the old woman's right eye. This is the old woman's nose. Oh. This is her oh. mouth. This is her chin, right? Her upper lip. And Ew. she's looking this way. <laughs> I didn't say she was a pretty old pretty. lady. She's just an old lady. For those who don't see the young woman, this is the young woman's uh, left eye and her nose. This is her chin and this is her ear. She's basically looking away from the screen. And this is her neck. And this is a necklace that she's wearing as she's looking away from the screen. So everybody able to see both of those now? Yeah, that's okay. weird. It is weird, but that's the point of an ambiguous image. However, so like I said, you take 100 people and you show this and 50 people will see the old woman first, 50 people will see the young woman first. But then you tell them to see the old, you know, you're going to see a picture of an old woman and suddenly 57 of those 100 see the old lady first. Or if you tell them, I'm going to show you a picture of a young lady looking away from the, the screen, 57 of them will see the young woman first. That doesn't sound like a huge difference, but statistically, mathematically, it is. Our expectations of what we're going to expect to see totally color what we actually see. And that's why that um, wit eyewitness you know, accounts can vary so incredibly dramatically from person to person, because what we perceive is very much colored by what we expect to see. No, and that's the nice thing about these ambiguous photos. With ambiguous photos, typically there doesn't seem to be any kind of psychological uh, uh, context to them, right? So, because you don't want that. You don't want there to be some kind of social or, 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 or cultural or other type of significance that could bias uh, what you're going to see. There's probably a lot of complicated things that cause you to see one versus the other. So when like, because you see this kind of on social media a lot they're like oh if you see this first you're this if you see this like there's a picture and you could see like maybe two or different things it's like if you see the tree first if you see the bird if you see the old man first yeah. or that's a lie <laughs> i won't say that it's a lie but what they they i can't i can't speak to the accuracy of those types of things right. but the difference between those images and these is like I said, these images don't have any social context to them really. Those types of images, if images do have some type of social or cultural, again, let's take, again, I, I, I'm not fam as familiar with these types of things, but let's take a really uh, simple example, example. Let's say for instance, you had some image that had a star of David and a cross in it. Right. If you were Catholic, you might be more likely to notice the, the cross first. If you were Jewish, you might be more likely to notice the Star of David first. So in that case, that wouldn't be a neutral image. That would be something that had some type of cultural significance that could influence what you're going to see first because of your expectations. So if it's not if it's an ambiguous photo that has culturally relevant material in it, that could impact what you're more likely to see. Now, whether that's valid enough where you can have a test to know whether you're an introvert or an extrovert because you saw a kitty cat versus a dog, right? Or something like that. Yeah, yeah. I'm, not sure, I'm not sure you could go that far with those kind of things. Yeah, the same thing with the crosswords. The way, what word you see first is like, you know, tells you what your year is going to be like, you know, whether you see friendship or whether you see money <laughs> or all those kind of things. Yeah. And again, those are things that aren't ambiguous. Those do have social, cultural, uh, uh, factors embedded in them. And so, uh, again, I don't know how valid those things are, but I would say that they're probably not completely random because of that. Sure. Right. <clears throat> again, one of the challenges that we have is our understanding of the world. And the biggest thing that affects our understanding of the world is vision.
Vision is the biggest factor that shapes our understanding of the world. Probably one of the best examples that you see of this are bats. How do bats get around the world? Uh, they're, they're hearing, like a location yeah. or something? Like a location. Basically, they make a high frequency noise that bounces off the world around them, comes back to them, and tells them about the world. You could put a bat in a completely dark room, thread a fishing wire all over the room, and at the other side of the room, you release a bat. Uh, pardon me, you release a moth. The bat, using its echolocation, can navigate all that fishing wire, get to the moth, and have his breakfast. However, then you do the exact same thing, and you turn the lights on. Bats have great hearing. Echolocation is how they get around. They have horrible vision. Vision so bad that they can't really see fishing wire. So now they're flying towards the moth. Their echolocation tells them there is something right in front of them. Their vision doesn't see that something. And so what happens? Do they caught. listen to their echolocation and move around the wire? Yeah. No, they fly right into it. Even though, even though their echolocation is screaming at them, there's something there. The fact that they don't see it overrides that and they run into the wire. So, so why do they have eyes? Like, wouldn't it be better if they were just blind and then they used echolocation for everything, even in the daytime? Possibly, but I don't know. Why, 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 why? Who knows why? Yeah. Let's look at an example. Why is one of those challenging questions that's hard to answer? Let's look at, oh, do I have it here? Yeah, like why even use your eyes if they're that bad? Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, or because they're that important. We get, understand the world around us based on that information. Where is my McGurk? There it is. Ah, okay. That didn't work. All right, I'm going to cheat and mute this for a second. Uh, hold on. Let me mute my mic. All right, did you guys hear any of that? No. No. Good. All right, excellent. All right, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to either 
half, half of you should open your eyes, half of you should close your eyes. So everybody on the left side of the classroom, open your eyes. Everybody on the right side of the classroom, close your eyes. So obviously you get to choose which one you are. And I want you to listen to what this man is saying. And he is either saying one of two things. He's either saying Baba or Gaga. So I want you to listen to, I mean, Baba or Dada. Baba or Dada are the two things that he is saying. So watch him and listen, or just close your eyes and listen. All right. Baba, Baba, Baba. All right. How many people had their eyes open for that? I did. And what did you hear? What did I see or hear? What did you hear? Baba. While watching? Yeah. Do it again. Watch, watch his mouth and listen to what he's saying. Baba, Baba, Baba. So everybody do it together. Everybody watch him as he's saying this. Baba, Baba, Baba. What do you hear while you watch him? I hear Baba, but I see Da Da. Okay, so interesting. So you, so, yeah, me too. Okay. <laughs> well, so close your eyes and listen. Okay. Baba, Baba, Baba. All right. So you got the right idea. What are you actually hearing when you remove all the other stimulus? Baba. Baba. Absolutely. Watch. Now, this time, what I want you to do, notice he says it three times. So, what I want you to do is watch his mouth the first time he says it, close your eyes for the second time, and then watch his mouth for the third time. Ba, 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 ba. Do you hear the same thing all three times? No. 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 Oh, some of you do, okay. And part of it could be your distance from the screen and how large this is. Again, this is harder to do in this kind of Zoom environment. But basically what this McGurk effect shows us is that we all have the ability to read lips. Again, this isn't new information. You know this because, again, I, although I'm going to have to come up with a new example now, but last season, Buster Posey was sitting at the plate, bases are loaded, bottom of the ninth, full count, and he gets a fastball about eyeball high that the umpire calls strike three. And even though they don't play the audio, can you tell what he yells when that happens? Right? You can read his lips and you know what he's saying because we are able to do that. And that's exactly what's happening here. Again, notice and just listen to his words. Close your eyes and listen to his words. Ba, 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 ba. Right? The sound that they're playing here is ba ba. However, notice if I mute it and we watch it and you just watch his mouth. What he's actually mouthing is ga ga. His mouth is saying ga ga, ga ga, ga ga. Watch it again. Now, what they've done is they've played the ba-ba sound over the ga-ga movement. Your brain is hearing, your ears are hearing ba-ba, and that is what it is telling your brain. However, your eyes are telling your brain that there's no way that sound can be coming out of that mouth, that mouth movement. And so because what you're seeing doesn't match the audio, your brain switches it a little bit and makes it sound like a harder sound, like a da-da. So you hear closer to a da-da when this is occurring because of that perception change that your brain knows that mouth movement can't make that sound. And again, you're experiencing this all the time right now in class. Clearly, you're seeing my mouth moving and hearing my voice, but is my voice actually coming out of my mouth? The speaker? Yeah, it's coming out of the speaker to the side, but you're perceiving it coming out of my mouth because my mouth is moving at the same time that the sounds are moving, right? It's the ventriloquism effect. 
That's exactly what a ventriloquist does, right? He moves his hands while not moving his mouth, and you perceive the sound coming out of his puppet, not out of his own mouth, right? Because something is moving at the same time that the words are coming out, and that captures the illusion. And that's basically, the McGurk is just an example of that. We are able to read lips. And this is another example of that. All right. So again, questions on any of that? I have a question. Oh, yeah. sorry. Anyone? No, oh, um, I just had a question about um, when we were looking at the two pictures of the moon. Mm -hmm. um, is that why when like the sun sets or like when the moon is coming up, it looks so much bigger than when exactly. it's up in the sky? Yeah, exactly. That is exactly what that illusion is. Is that's exactly what that that illusion represents is again, obviously it is even in this simple illustration, they don't look the same, but you're right out in the real world, it's so much more powerful. So absolutely, when we look, you know, just with these simple lines, it can make the right circle look big. I mean, the left circle look bigger than the right circle. But when you're out in the real world with all of your perspective information, then yeah, the moon looks huge when it's at the horizon and tiny when it's at its apex. Absolutely. Okay. Ava, did you have a question as well, I heard? Yeah, so um, after kind of learning more about like the visual system, do you think it's important for like people who are in psychology to take anatomy and physiology to like understand how the brain works and like your visual processes and all that? One of the cool things about the field of neuroscience is that there is a true spectrum on which it is studied. There are some neuroscientists who spend their entire lives looking at a one, one specific protein channel. Remember, we talked about those voltage gated sodium channels. There were people who made their career basically changing the length of the chain of that ball and chain for the inactivation gate. And so they're studying how the brain works at a molecular level. Whereas at the other end of the spectrum, you have neuroscientists and even psychologists who were looking at things like perception, things like consciousness, you know, things like that as well. So there are so many different layers that you can study this material at. Obviously, if you're studying uh, perception or, or consciousness, there is some basic anatomy that they have to know or understand, obviously, um, at the same way that that person at the molecular end kind of has to know the pieces that it is used to put together. But it's such a broad field. One of, one of the funnest experiences in graduate school that I had was going to the Society of Neuroscience meetings, where basically you get to present your research. You do your research and you either make a poster or you give a talk and the range of concepts that people cover in this field, it's such a huge massive field, there's so much we don't know about. It's a five day seminar where it's just, you get to see the entire spectrum of what people are studying. So yeah, there's some people who are studying these things that don't need to look at any of the anatomy or really understand the anatomy to do it and vice versa. Someone who's studying the, you know, the, uh, the molecules, the, the, the molecular components of channels doesn't care how you know action potentials are causing us to see light you know so i mean it, it it there is no one way to study this field and that's one of the amazing things about it it's so broad it's so bold that there's something for everybody in there okay thank you yeah any other questions Well, the good news is that is everything that we needed to cover for today. So we are done with all of the new material. So all we have left is our review. So let's go ahead and take one more break. Uh, we'll take just a quick 10 minute break because it shouldn't take more than that. Again, give those people who want a chance to flee the building. Everybody else get a quick biology break, get some caffeine or get something like that. And at 1015, we'll come back with our question and answer review. See what we need to cover, see what questions you guys have and see what I can do to help you to be successful on both the lab lecture and on the final exam. Are we splitting right. it up or just doing it all together? All together. Oh, okay. Any and all comers. Okay. All right, I'll take any question you guys have. All right.
Anything else before we take our break? All right, I'll see you guys in 10 minutes. I am done with my song and dance. It is now your turn. You guys get to drive, excuse me, the rest of this. Ask questions and we will try to come up with the answers together. Do you mind reminding us how uh, glutamate and GABA affect the synapse and where they come from exactly? Great, so as far as what you need to know about glutamate and GABA, is basically two things. When we talk about common neurotransmitters, there are differences between those that are in the central nervous system and those that are in the peripheral nervous system. As we've seen, not surprisingly, by far the most common neurotransmitter in the peripheral nervous system is acetylcholine. And the other big thing we saw about acetylcholine is acetylcholine is the most common excitatory and the most common inhibitory in the peripheral nervous system. And again, remember we talked about the way it can do that is by having different types of receptors. We saw the muscarinic and we saw the nicotinic. And so those two different types of uh, cholinergic receptors is what allows acetylcholine to be both the most common excitatory and the most common inhibitory neurotransmitter in the peripheral nervous system. However, it may be the most common in the peripheral nervous system, but it's not the most common in the central nervous system. In the central nervous system, the two most common are glutamate and GABA. And the big difference between the two is glutamate is the most common excitatory neurotransmitter in the central nervous system, and GABA is the most common inhibitory neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. They're still a neurotransmitter. So when you were talking about how they work, they still work the same way. They're in the synaptic end bulbs of a axon. They're released by exocytosis. And on the target cell, there's gonna be some receptors that they're gonna to bind to. And glutamate being excitatory, most commonly opens sodium channels. Because as we know, sodium entering the cell is usually the easiest way to make a cell more positive. GABA primarily opens chloride channels. Because as we know, chloride wants in the cell and when chloride enters into the cell, it makes the cell more negative. So again, even this part is just the most common, but not the only ways that they work. So really our primary focus, oops, wow. Is again, we don't care so much about the fact which neurotransmitter it does. We just, the key we were trying to say is this distinction here. Oh God, I did it again. Thank you. But you get the idea. The point is, I'll put it all back now. Glutamate is the most common excitatory neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. GABA is the most common inhibitory in the central nervous system. Whereas in the peripheral nervous system, it's acetylcholine for both. Okay. And I'm tired of erasing stuff, so I'm not going to do it anymore. All right. Excellent. Augustina, you got a question, looks like. Uh, Yes. Okay. Let's look at just one eye for starters. This kind of goes with the refraction that we learned about just now. So let's say we're looking top down. So this is my right eye. And just for argument's sakes, we'll go ahead and draw left eye as well. So we're looking at this from the top. If you cover or close your left eye, 
notice you don't just see the right side of the world. You see, like if you think from the nose over, you see every, a lot of stuff from the nose over, but you do still see some over here on the left. So out in the real world here, there is stuff that is on the left side, oops, left side of the real world. And there is stuff that is on the right side of the real world. Okay. Now, as we just learned, when something comes into the eyeball with that refraction, things that are on the left go to the right. Things that are on the right go to the left side of the eye. Our information reverses. All right. You with me so far? Okay. So notice here into my eye, I have some information that we're going to draw in brown and some right information that we're drawing in green. The problem is back here in the brain, and I'll make, whoops, I'll make my two hemispheres of the brain here. In my occipital lobe, I want only information from the contralateral side. So what that means is over here on the right occipital lobe, we want the left side of the world. And over here in the left occipital lobe, we want only right side of the world. The same way that the right side of my brain tells me everything that my left side is feeling. The right side of my brain moves everything on my left. We want the same thing. Everything from the right side of the world, we wanna to go to the left side of the brain. So again, with me so far there. Excellent. All right. So now you see our problem. Our problem is that my right eye is getting information from both sides. But we only want the brown stuff over here, and we only want the green stuff over here. So we need a way to fix this. Notice information that came in from my left eye, this, these axons over here are already getting left information and we want them to stay on the right side. So as their axons leave out that optic nerve, we need them to stay on the right side of the body. Whereas axons that are getting information from the right side of the world, we need those to cross to bring that information over here. And the same thing's happening on this side. Information from the right side of the world is coming into my left eye. Information from the left side of the world is coming into my left eye. Again, this information from the left side, as it comes out, we need it to cross to go to the right side of the brain. And information from the outside of the eye that's from the right world, we want to stay on this side. So notice in both for both eyes, some information crosses and some doesn't. So these are the pathways that our axons make. And these pathways basically form our three structures. These first structures right up here that contain eye-specific information is the optic nerves. I have a question. Yes. So if you point to this on, like, let's say on the, because I know there's um, an actual, like, 
I guess, illustration that you showed us before. If you pointed that on the exam and said, what is this? Let's finish um, this and the then we'll do that. Okay. Let's, let's finish this and then we'll do that. Then both optic nerves come together into a single structure. This single structure where both optic nerves come together, we called the optic chiasm. And this is where we get that partial crossing of axons. And then the optic chiasm splits again to form side specific pieces of information. And those side specific pieces of information are the optic tracks. Now, we've done this here with this simple illustration, but you're right. We have seen this before. Probably the easiest place to see where we've seen this before is when we were talking about the cranial nerves. Notice here, when we were counting our cranial nerves, if I have an arrow on the exam and I have it pointing right here to this structure, and I asked you to identify that structure, what would this structure be? The optic track. Well, if, if, if all What's else that? fails, you could cheat and follow the line. Well, optic nerve, I just didn't know. Okay. Yeah, those are the two optic nerves, right? So, so a nerve is a structure, consider a structure? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. I mean, if structure is something you can hold in your hand, right? Right. However, if I took my arrow and pointed it to the center part here, what would that be? Optic triasm. Chiasm, excellent. And then if I pointed it to this structure back here, what would that be? Oh, that would be the optic track. That would be the optic track. So notice on an actual brain image, we could see these things. In fact, we can see it on a real brain too. Notice there's the optic nerve. Here's the optic chiasm where they come together. And there's the optic track. And again, it is a little trickier to see it on this. That is a little bit harder to see, but technically we could see it there. And the other place we saw it was when we were actually talking about the optic nerve. Here is a good place. Again, here we can see these structures more clearly because this is what it's been emphasizing. Uh, structure one, structure two, structure three. But notice our brainstem model shows it as well. Structure one, nerve. Structure two, chiasm. Structure three, tract. And notice here, you see the partial crossing, but I think we also have one other picture. Uh, nope, I guess I lied. I don't have that. So this is so, again, but this shows how we were talking about we want all the red stuff to go to one side. So some stays and some crosses and all the green stuff to go to the other side. Some stays and some crosses so that everything from the right comes to the left and everything from the left goes to the right. Did that help? Uh, Excellent. All right, on the subject of nerves. Um, when we're talking cranial nerves and taste, uh, really it's primarily facial. So facial sensory structure is the taste of the anterior two thirds. Remember we talked about with nine and 10, it's more 
chemical perception or tactile perception. So, I mean, it kind of was, we kind of, kind of taste in quotes. And since it's taste in quotes, I would say that if you asked me what cranial nerve was involved in taste, I would say facial nerve seven, because that's the primary one. The other ones add to it, but, uh, but the sky's blue answer is at seven. For the optic nerve, my question was, um, when we were doing the nerves, we put for the functions for vision, but if you were to ask us, like point to this, for example, when we were going over it, you said eye specific. Well, I just, information. I was emphasizing that the axons are carrying different information. Remember, as right. we talked about, one of the ways we can see how these structures in the brain work is if they're damaged. Right. Notice if you cut your optic nerve, that would basically be the same thing as covering your eye or ripping your eyeball out. You would basically see nothing from your right eye. However, if you cut the optic track, would that be like removing one eye? No. No. What would happen in that case, so let's erase our first cut just to make sure this is clear. If you were to damage your optic track, notice this is the left optic track that was damaged. Basically, everything here from my nose over, everything in the right side of the world, I would not be able to see, no matter which eye was open. If I was using my left eye, I would only see from here over. If I was using my right eye, I would only see from here over. I would only see stuff on the left side of the visual world. Everything on the right side of the visual world would be lost no matter which eye I used. And so that was why I made the point of eye specific versus side specific, because those are the kind of axons. And that's because of this partial crossing. Okay. But yeah, no, if I, if I ask you for the function of this cranial nerve, you can just say vision. That's okay. fine. Yeah. All right. Next question. Could you explain the stretch and reflex your reflexes? Um, not with just a picture, but like doing like steps almost. For what? The flex, the flexor reflex and the stretch reflex. Because I think sure. I'm kind of confused. Yeah, since you're not gonna be able to draw the images on the exam, then that's easy. We'll just do it in words. So let's do that. Like any reflex, and we can do the stretch reflex first. But like any reflex, a reflex, uh, these spinal reflexes that you're responsible for have how many components to them? Like really all, oh, there you go, excellent mention's got a five. What are the five components? Receptor. Excellent. The, uh, afferent pathway. Yeah. Sensory or, sensory or afferent, we can do either way. Both would be acceptable. Oops. Integration. Excellent. What else? The somatic or um, motor pathway. Yes. Now, again, this is a spinal reflex. So, yes, it would be a somatic motor, but we can just say motor or because, again, this if we want to be uh, generic to any reflex, then it would be a motor or an efferent pathway. And then what's the fifth component? The factor. Yeah. Excellent. So cool. Once we have those, then we just have to fill in the blanks. So let's move this over. For the stretch reflex, what is the receptor? The muscle spindle. Excellent. And the quadriceps femoris. Well, yeah, true, for the stretch in, in. Excellent. And what does that muscle spindle do? 
what stretches it? the muscle. Well, it doesn't stretch the muscle. Or it lengthen. measures the stretch yeah. of the muscle. Excellent. So the muscle gets stretched. All right. So let's let, well, let's just talk about the components first, and then we'll talk about the reflex. What is the sensory or the afferent pathway? Well, obviously it's made up of a sensory neuron. What do we know about sensory neurons? Unicor. Excellent. More specifically, it's a somatic sensory neuron. It's unipolar. Excellent. Uh, it's axon. Helps to form our spinal nerves because it's a spinal pathway after all. And where's anytime we talk about a neuron, it's probably good to know where its cell body is located. Where is its cell body located? Excellent, dorsal root ganglion. And obviously its axon enters in the posterior part of the posterior gray horn of the spinal cord. Excellent. Uh, I need a little bit more space. So for the for the dorsal root ganglion, I understand that the somatic sensory neurons come from there, but for the dorsal gray horn, what neurons come from there? Well, as we know, interneurons can be found. Interneurons, there. okay. Right. The point is that it comes into the back of the spinal cord. Right. right. Excellent. Our synapses, I mean, our integration is going to be the synapses. And the stretch reflex, what do we know about the stretch reflex? We know it's spinal, we know it's somatic. What else do we know about the stretch reflex? One synapse. Monosynaptic. So in this case, if there's just one synapse. And that one synapse is between the sensory neuron and the motor neuron. Of course, that somatic motor neuron is forming our motor pathway. So clearly we are starting with a somatic motor neuron. What do we know about somatic motor neurons? They're multipolar. Excellent. Where is its cell body located? In the anterior gray horn. And its axon helps to form the spinal nerve. And it goes to an effector. And what is our effector in the case of the stretch reflex? The skeletal muscle or... Um specifically the muscle spindle that was stretched earlier. Exactly. Now we've identified the pathway. So now we can say what happens. So now that we have a pathway, we can talk about what happens, right? We have a disturbance. That disturbance is what? It throws off balance, I don't know. Well, okay, pressure, yeah. pressure from what? Absolutely, pressure from what? What actually happens with the stretch reflex? When do you typically experience the stretch reflex in action? When you're moving? Yeah, in the doctor's office. Yeah. He hits you in the knee. He hits that patella ligament with a hammer. And that stretches the muscle.
And when it quickly stretches the muscle, the spindle fires lots of action potentials. Those action potentials are carried in through that sensory pathway to our synapse. And what kind of an effect does our sensory neuron have on the motor neuron, excitatory or inhibitory? Excitatory. Yeah, excites the motor neuron. And when it excites the motor neuron, motor neuron fires action potentials. Those action potentials go out to the muscle. And when they're stimulated by these action potentials, what does the muscle do? Kick the structure. Yeah. yeah. Muscle contracts. contracts. Leg kicks out. All right. And he knows that these. Uh, Reflexes that are helpful in maintaining your balance and equilibrium are working pro pro properly. Because this is normally what happens, right? If I start to lean to one side, that muscle stretches out. You know, usually I'm not leaning this much, a small lean. So there's a small uh, stretch, a small number of action potentials, a small excitation of the muscle, and the muscle contracts and brings me back. All right, that's how I'm able, then I start to lean the other way and the other muscle contracts and brings me back, right? As I'm standing here normally, these are small, tiny contractions, so much so that you usually don't even see them. But when he hits the knee with the hammer, he tricks the muscle into thinking it's suddenly getting stretched out really long, really quickly. So how does it respond? By contracting really quickly to try to bring the body back into balance. So this one is important for maintaining balance. And this is how it works. These are the components, and that's how it works. And can we do the exact same thing for the withdrawal reflex? Yes. Yep. Absolutely. So let's do that. Withdrawal reflex. Let's go through the five parts. What is the receptor? The free nerve ending. Oops, hold on. Yeah. Transmitters. Right. And of course, what is that free nerve ending measuring? Pain. Pain. Excellent. What's our sensory or afferent pathway? Sensory neurons. Yeah. Isn't it really pretty much the exact same thing we just wrote? Yeah. Same. So let's do that. Somatic sensory neurons, unipolar axon form spinal nerve, cell body uh, located dorsal root ganglion. Uh, and uh, axon enters posterior gray form. Perfect. And not only is the somatic sensory pathway the same, what else is the same? Integration. Nope, not the emote integration, but what else is the same? I mean, the um, efferent pathway. Yeah, exactly. We have the exact same thing. Somatic motor neurons. Multipolar body in anterior gray horn, axon, spinal nerve. Excellent. So those two are the same, but what's not the same is the synapses. And let's start with the effector. What is the effector? It's sort of the same in that it's skeletal muscle. However, What's the big difference here? There's excitatory and inhibitory. Exactly. There's really two skeletal muscles we want to affect. We want to affect a flexor 
which is going to pull us away. And we want to affect the extensor, which we want to make sure uh, relaxes so that we can pull away. So that is the one trick. We need two uh, effectors. And so that also means on our synaptic pathway, there's going to be two motor neurons, one to each. of the effectors. Excellent, let's change the color of that to emphasize that. Now, where things get a little trickier is here in the synapses. Again, integration is still going to occur in the synapses, but remember our withdrawal reflex is a polysynaptic reflex. And in fact, does anybody remember exactly how many reflexes, how many synapses we're going to have in the withdrawal reflex? Close. We have actually three, three synapses. Synapse one is the one we just talked about. Our sensory neuron, let's say it this way, to our uh, flexor motor neuron. And this one is excitatory. But we also have our sensory neuron to an interneuron. This one is also excitatory. And then lastly, the interneuron to our extensor motor neuron. And this is the one that's inhibitory. Now, just listing them there might help. But again, I think just like we did before, if we actually go through all of this and see how it works, now that we have the parts, we can make sense of it. Again, we have a disturbance. What is the disturbance in this case? Something painful. Yeah, we prick our thumb. Right. That stimulates the pain receptors. And as a result of that, we send action potentials to the spinal cord. Right. Just like before. Comes in the sensory pathway. And notice it has two effects. This sensory neuron coming in is going to excite the flexor. And so this neuron fires action potentials. These action potentials go to our flexor muscle. And what does our flexor muscle do? Contracts. Our sensory neuron also excites the interneuron. So our interneuron fires action potentials. And it goes to the extensor motor neuron. However, when it fires action potentials, it inhibits our extensor motor neuron. Our extensor motor neuron communicates with the extensor. Now, if it is inhibited, it 
If it's inhibited, is it going to fire action potentials? Not your question. If a neuron is inhibited, does it fire action potentials? No. So notice there are no action potentials coming to the extensor. And if there's no action potentials coming to the extensor, what is the extent, what is the state of the extensor going to be? It's going to be relaxed. And so we've accomplished our goal. We've relaxed the extensor, we've contracted the flexor, and we pulled our body away. While the stretch reflex is important for balance and equilibrium, this one is to protect us, protect us from pain. All right. That make it more sense? Yes, thank you. All right. Any more questions on this one? All right, what else you got? Oh, both, great question. Remember, in both cases, what's happening on the right side of the body stays on the right side of the body. So if I'm touching something, I pull away. If I hit my right leg, my right leg's the one that sticks out. So in this case, both of these are ipsilateral. Yep, so both of these are ipsilateral. In fact, both of them are somatic, both of them are spinal, both of them are ipsilateral. The only way that they're really different is this one is monosynaptic and this one is polysynaptic. So from a descriptive standpoint, they're all spinal, they're all somatic, they're all ipsilateral. But one's got only one synapse, whereas one has three synapses. All right, excellent. Next question. If anyone doesn't, I have one. No, hold on, looks like there's. Um, so, okay, I'll answer, I'll answer. Um, Mitch's question first, because it's simple. Uh, you need to know that autonomic plexuses exist. And uh, it doesn't hurt to know that the uh, celiac or solar plexus is the one that gets disrupted when you have uh, get the wind knocked out of you because the phrenic nerve innervates it. But other than that, you don't need to know the names or anything else other than they're made up of both parasympathetic and sympathetic. And now, because of the solar plexus, we can see even some somatic neurons make it into it. But other than that, you don't need to know anything. Uh, Augustina, let me answer your general question too. And then, because I'm guessing Ava has a more specific one. For the final, since it's like, hold up, I can't even say the word. Cumulative. Um, is it going to be like small detailed questions or should we just study like the main concepts from every single section? So I would go main concepts. So here, here is how I kind of see the breakdown. And again, obviously the way these are being generated, this isn't gonna be 100% accurate, but in general, the way the final is set up is, is big global pieces of information, right? 50% uh, of the final should just be aha information. Stuff that we've used so much in this class uh, that uh, it's obvious information. And again, you should know right away, right? Uh, what is the most common cation in the body? All right, it's supposed to be one of those easy pieces of information that you know right off the rolls right off the tongue. Come on, if you guys can't answer this, you have no hope next week. Most common cation, not inside the cell, in the body in general. I thought I heard someone say it. 
Calcium? Uh, close. Calcium, remember, makes cells do wonky things. Come on, what's the most common? Which, which ion have we talked about the most in this class? Sodium. Sodium. Sodium is the one we've talked about the most in this class. And is there more of it inside or outside the cell? Outside. 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 What's the most common cation inside the cell? Potassium. Potassium. The sodium potassium pumps. How many sodiums does it move into the cell? Three. How many potassium does it move out? Yeah, and then two out. Two out, absolutely, right? All of that, what makes cells do wonky things? Calcium. Yeah, see, there's some information that we've used again and again and again in this class that should be very obvious and very, should be very straightforward. And especially because you have all of the correct answers there, you just have to recognize the correct answer. It should just be aha information. Now, the one thing I will remind you on that is that uh, multiple choice questions basically by definition are tricky because if a multiple choice question was very straightforward, then the answer would be super obvious. So they write them in such a way that you have to read them very carefully. If you misread one word, right, you're going to get tricked and they're going to have that trap answer there to catch you. So make sure you read them carefully. In fact, one of the things that I encourage you to do is to just read the question first and don't read the possible answers. Try to think what the right answer would be, then read the multiple choice question a second time and then look at the answers to see if the answer that you thought was there was there. And also reading a second time, make sure you check to see the way you read it the first time was the way that it actually is. So take your time with them. Do not rush. You have plenty of time. Two hours is more than a minute a question, right? If I were to stand here and stare at you for a minute, you know, without saying a word, just staring at the screen, you would be totally creeped out by it because a minute is a long period of time. So take your time, read the questions carefully so you can answer them correctly. As I've said many times, people lose points, not because they don't know the information, but because they don't read the questions carefully. And unlike an essay question where you can show me knowledge and get partial credit, there's no partial credit on a multiple choice quest question. It's all or nothing, right? You could master a piece of information. Heck, your uncle could have been one that discovered it. You could have had your picture taken with that piece of information, but you misread that one word, you misinterpret the question. There's that trap answer there and you get zero points. So as long as you take your time- test? I am, but you got to remember, uh, I've made a bank of questions. Right. Okay. If you're in the in the classroom, everybody gets the exact same test, and I write it. Right. I've written the questions. I've put them in the test bank. But which hundred of those questions you're getting, I have very little control over. So then, are they going to be like? So I know we have five sections. Will it somewhat be close to like twenty per section, or is it just going to be random? It would be, it's going to be close to 20 per section. So I have okay. some control. Like I, okay. for instance, I can have, I can have 10 action potential questions and tell it to pick three of them, but I don't know which three you're going to get. But yes, it should be a fairly straightforward, um, uh, close to, you know, and again, some sections had more information than others. So it might be a little bit more uh, than others, but it's going to be close to 20 questions per section, somewhere around there. But so again, 50% is just that aha information. Um, so yes, so the other 50%, 30% should be stuff that you might have to think a little bit about. And then, you know, maybe 20%, you might have to fire a, a neuron or two to be able to figure out the correct answer. It is, while you need to know, well, there are important concepts that we've talked about in this class. Um, I think a good example of the way to think of this information is, for instance, if I were to be talking about the bicep brachia, I may ask you to identify the bone that it originated from, but not the bone feature, right? So I could say, you know, what muscle, you know, which of the four muscles like listed below, you know, originates from the femur or something like that. But I'm not going to ask you what muscles 
uh, you know, what muscle in, you know, uh, originates from the supraglenoid tubercle of the scapula. So again, I'm not going to quite ask information that way. Now, that doesn't mean you don't have to know some general information. Like I said, obviously, knowing three sodiums are kicked out and two in is a specific piece of information. Uh, but, uh, but again, the key to this is you have all the correct answers there. You have to be able to recognize the correct answer and not pull it out of the ether. Uh, what I would say is that the uh, in in the past the averages on the um, final are similar to the averages that we see on the last couple lecture exams. Our lecture exams are getting closer to the 70, 72 range that they should be, uh, and even a little bit higher. So usually that should be the range. And remember, this counts as a grade on its own, but also can replace your lowest lecture score. So I'd also say probably easily 80% of students are able to use their final to replace one of their lecture scores. Now, for some people, they may get three points added to their score, but there are plenty of times where I've had students get 20, 30, even 40 points added back into their score by doing really good on the final. And, you know, especially if they bombed the first test because they didn't know what to expect. And now they figured out how to study, figured out how to prepare, figured out how to be successful. And, you know, their lowest lecture score was a 50 and they get an 85 on the final and boom, 35 points are added back into their score. So it can cause a big swing. So it can definitely help, especially, especially for those of you who may have struggled uh, somewhere along the way. All right. Percentage wise, how I, I haven't done it, calculated it yet, but like how. Um... I don't know. And that's, okay. I haven't bothered doing the math. Again, yeah. we're going to finish, we're going to finish somewhere around, you know, 12, 1300 points. The test itself counts as a hundred and then can, you know, add additional points on, on top of that. So uh, again, so it's, you know, a uh, hundred points out of 1200 is less than 10% of your grade. So, uh, but, uh, but it can, like I said, it can help. Uh, like I said, I would, uh, I don't, there shouldn't be a biggest section. Like I said, it should be fairly evenly split, right? Again, there was a lot in the muscle and a lot of physiology in the muscle. So maybe instead of 20, it'll be 23. The first section may not have had as much, or a lot of that information relates to stuff in the other. So maybe that'll only have 17, but we're not talking about big variations. It should be pretty even split. We've had five sections um, and, uh, and there are four or five, uh, you know, that one fifth of the test should be approximately for all of them. So it's mainly physiology on the... There will be some, there could be some illustrations, labeled illustrations, where, you know, identify mm -hmm. the structure labeled A or something like that. Remember nitric oxide and substance P are additional neurotransmitters. Nitric oxide was unique because it's a gas. Uh, primarily used uh, for smooth muscle to control the diameter of our blood vessels. And substance P was the neurotransmitter that was used in our pain pathway. So that's what you need to know for those. I'm sorry, I think I spoke over you, Ava. What were you saying? I don't remember, it's okay. <laughs> All right. Any more questions? I had one, but you okay. had other people because I have more specific questions. Um, could you explain the somatic motor pathway and then the um, autonomic motor pathway in words to, I think we drew it out. So again, for both of these pathways, they have a start, they have a path, and they have an end. For both our somatic motor and for our autonomic motor, where do both of them start? The anterior one? Well, they both start in the central nervous system.
but as you hinted at, they don't start in the same place in the central nervous system. Where does our somatic motor pathway begin in the central nervous system? You said it, so say it again. The anterior. anterior. And how does that differ from the autonomic pathway? There you go. Lateral gray horn. Excellent. That's why I spell lateral correctly. Excellent. Let's start with the other easy part, the end. What is the effect? They both obviously end at effectors. What is the effector of our somatic motor pathway? Skeletal muscle. There you go. Autonomic ends at the effector as well. But what are the effectors in this pathway? Smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and glands. Excellent. So now then that all that leads us with is the pathway. Our pathway involves how many neurons in the somatic motor pathway? How many neurons to get from the anterior gray horn to the skeletal muscle effector? Two. No, nope, Mitch has got it one. One neuron, right? Its cell body, as we mentioned, is located in the anterior gray horn. Its synapses at the effector. And what do we know about this neuron's axon? Myelinated. Excellent. Axon is, oops, myelin. What's going on here? Oh, did I hit the insert button? I did. There we go. Excellent. What neurotransmitter does it release? See a coin. And what's its effect? Excited. There you go. Do we need so, to know where the cell body is located too? We already did that. Anterior gray horn. Well, like if it's closer, okay. There is no closer. There's one. Okay. One neuron that goes from central nervous system all the way to the effector. Okay. All right. What you're thinking of is... Yeah, I'm getting confused. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So how many neurons in the pathway of the autonomic nervous system? Two. So, of course, we're going to need to give those two neurons names. What do we call the first one? Pre uh, pre ganglion? No. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, pre ganglionic. And post ganglionic. Ganglionic and post ganglionic. Excellent. What do we know about the pre ganglionic neuron? It's myelinated. Okay. Where is its cell body? Is it closer to the right now? There you go. We just got it. It's in the lateral gray horn. Its axon is myelinated. Where does it synapse? Are the effectors? Yeah, well, nope, doesn't go to the effectors. This one goes to the autonomic ganglion. What neurotransmitter does it release? Norepinephrine and epinephrine? Nope, just okay. <laughs> going to this one. Excellent. And I'll what is the talking. effect? <laughs> Uh, 
That's the effect of this acetylcholine, always excitatory. Oops. Excellent. Oops, I lost my screen. Uh, da, 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 da. All right, let's do the same thing for the postganglionic neuron. Where is its cell body located? on the ganglion. What do we know about its axon? Unmyelinated. Excellent. Where is it synapse? On the effector. What neurotransmitter is it going to release? neurotransmitters, acetylcholine or norepinephrine, and absolutely the effect can be excitatory or inhibitory, it depends on the effector. So notice in our autonomic nervous system, it takes two neurons to get from central nervous system to effector. Whereas on our somatic motor pathway, it just takes one neuron to get from central nervous system to effector. Where I think you are getting confused is that you are trying to think of the differences between the sympathetic and parasympathetic, which are both autonomic. This is our general autonomic pathway but you are right. There are differences between the sympathetic and parasympathetic. We can do that next, but let's make sure we understand this first. And I guess too, since I went ahead and drew it anyway, let's finish it off by putting myelin on these axons to remind us of that and not on that one. I think like when I, I mean, it helps when you draw it, but we obviously can't do it. Like when I'm drawing it, it's fine. Okay. I'm comparing but the two, but like. You have a whiteboard. Well, you're not required to draw it. If you want to bring up your whiteboard and draw these things for yourself so that you can then describe them in words on the exam, that's the whole point of having that whiteboard. I don't know how to use it. <laughs> there so. is a button where, where your picture is, underneath it is several buttons. Okay. The ones that make the images bigger, the ones that make the images smaller. And one of the buttons there brings up a whiteboard. And when you bring away, if you remember way back at the beginning of the class, we did an introduction to Proctorio where you required to draw a star and wave to me, right? And so that to draw that star, you had to bring up the whiteboard. You had to change your pen to a blue pen. You had to draw the star. Most of you hit the, um, the uh, paint bucket first. And so you made your whole <laughs> screens blue and then you had to change it back and then make your pen blue and then draw your star. So it took some work, but you did get a chance to play with it once before. So that is, yeah, if you wanna draw these things, you are absolutely encouraged. You can't have scratch paper. I can't control that, you know, cause even if you show me, I have a piece of paper here and it's totally blank. How do I know someone off camera is not giving you then something that has all the answers with it. So you can't have, have any kind of scratch that. paper that way, but what you do can do is bring up your whiteboard. What's your question? What if I have a whiteboard that's like no. maybe the size of, oh, no. okay, okay. <laughs> Yeah, again, because okay. how That's do right. I know that there aren't 15 of those and someone handing you one for each question? There's no way for me to monitor that. You cannot have any of those types okay. of resources around you. Don't have your, uh, you know, your whiteboards, don't have scratch paper, don't have your flashcards that you've been using to study. None of those things can be around you. Again, you can mind dump words. Again, that's one of the nice things about these. You can, I purposely set them up. Even the lab exam is set up in essay format. So there's no limit to how much you can write there. So if you want to mind dump a bunch of information before you answer the question, you don't have to erase it. You can just write, ignore everything above this and then write your answer there. You've got the whiteboard. If you want to do some drawing, if you're more tactile that way, you can do that. But you have to do it on the computer. You have to use the resources that are on the computer. Okay? Yes. All right. 
Any other questions on this? Somatic versus autonomic pathways. All right, excellent. So, oh, we were gonna do the differences. It's okay, I can do that on my own, you don't have to. So again, both of them use two neurons. So let's compare them. What are some of the differences between sympathetic and parasympathetic? Let's set up our three columns. What is one way that our sympathetic and parasympathetic pathways are different? The sympathetic it ganglia is closer to the central nervous system, whereas the parasympathetic ganglia is closer or even inside the walls of the effectors. Excellent. The locations, the autonomic ganglia for our sympathetic. They are closer to the central nervous system. Whereas in our parasympathetic, they are closer to the effectors. Or as you mentioned, sometimes even in the walls of the effectors. You think after two years of being on the computer, my typing would have gotten better, but nope. All right, what else? What's another way they're different? And again, notice we are, fo we are focusing here on anatomical differences. I'm not talking about how sympathetic makes the heart beat faster and parasympathetic makes the heart beat slower. Those are physiological. Right now we're talking about anatomical differences. We're talking about structural differences. So give me another structural difference. Um, the length of the axon is shorter and I wanna say myelinated for the sympathetic. Okay. Uh, so for the preganglionic. Yeah, there you go. I guess we could even say where it starts is different, right? No, both of them start in the central nervous system. Well, okay, we'll, we'll get to that in a second. But yes, for the preganglionic neuron, because the, uh, the ganglion are closer in the uh, sympathetic than these are shorter axons, whereas these are longer axons. What's the other big difference between the axons uh, for both the pre and the postganglionic? So, and then of course, postganglionic would then have to be longer axons, whereas this would have to be shorter. Although really that's kind of the same information, but that's fine. What's the other big difference between the axons between the sympathetic and parasympathetic? Sympathetic um, are elaborately branched, I think, right? Excellent. Sympathetic, elaborately branched. A lot of synapses. And form lots of uh, synapses. Whereas our parasympathetic are more discrete and form fewer. Synapses. You also mentioned starting point. Where does the sympathetic begin in the central nervous system? Excellent. So there's a good start. Lateral gray horn of the entire spinal cord. I just had it and I forgot. <laughs> well, clearly the answer is no, because I'm asking the question. No. So which regions of the spinal cord does it start in? Oh. 
Now let's work our way down. Does it start in the thoracic region of the spinal cord? No. Thoracic? Yes. Yes, right. lumbar? Yes. <laughs> Sacral? No. <laughs> there you go. Remember, we said that anatomically, the sympathetic is known as the thoracolumbar portion of the spinal cord. I mean, of the autonomic nervous system, because it starts in the thoracic and lumbar regions of the spinal cord. Anybody remember the anatomical term we gave for the parasympathetic? Craniosacral. Yeah, there you go. Exactly. Craniosacral because it is located off of the brainstem and the lateral gray horn of the sacral spinal cord. There you go. So they have different starting points. They have different neurotransmitters too, right? For the postganglionic neurons, remember all preganglionic neurons all release acetylcholine, but the neurotransmitter for the postganglionic neuron is different. For, well, let's start easy. For the parasympathetic, what neurotransmitter does all of our postganglionic neurons release? Acetylcholine. Whereas for our sympathetic, most release what? Norepinephrine. And then there are a few that release acetylcholine. So I think you were confusing this information with the yeah. previous information. And so that was where you were having your challenge. Thank you. All righty. And notice the beauty of both of these. We didn't have to do any drawings. I mean, I guess technically we did do a little drawing on this one, but it wasn't needed. We did that after the fact, right? We could erase there and still hopefully make sense of it. And here we didn't do any drawings at all. But again, your book does have those great pictures that did show those if you're a more visual learner and need that. All right, any more? Uh, yes. I can't do it obviously for the whole semester for like the final, but again, that's not as important, but we can remind ourselves of this for our nervous histology. Absolutely. And since it's a review, I will provide the questions. You will provide the answers. Identify the, uh, how do I want to ask the question? Identify the structure in the field of view. Cerebrum? No, not the cerebrum, but the other Cerebellum. one. Cerebellum. Cerebellum, <laughs> absolutely. Identify the cephalon in the field of view. Which cephalon is the cerebellum a part of? Telencephalon? No. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. Remember, there are the two enlargements, kind of like form in a T, pons in the front, cerebellum in the back, metencephalon. That is how I remember it. And of course, how did you know this was the cerebellum? The leaves. True, that's one of it. <laughs> but let's identify the substance. The structure. White matter? Nope, not white matter. Which one's this one? Gray. Gray matter. What's oh this gosh. one? Gray. gray. Yeah, and remember two layers of gray matter. And then the deep, identify this substance. White, white matter. White matter. Remember this forms that elaborate structure. Identify the elaborate structure formed by all this white matter. Arbor vitae. Arbor vitae. Excellent. And remember, we came here because right here on the boundary between the two layers of the gray matter 
And again, at this magnification, we can't even see it, but because when we know location, we know structure and function, what is the name of the cell that we would find here between the two layers of the gray matter? Protein cells. cells. Excellent. What is its structural classification? Multipolar. And what is its functional classification? Inner neuron. Inner neuron, exactly. There you go. Notice we don't even see the cell on this picture, but because we know where we are, we know the answer to that location because we know a location, we know structure, we know function, we know name. Here at a higher mag, oh, actually we should go back. Identify the general structure. Here, maybe I'll do it this way. What is this general structure? Folium. Folium. Identify the space or the groove. Sulcus. Sulcus, there you go. Notice here, we can now actually see those nuclei of those cells, those Purkinje cells that are located here. We can see a little bit of the white matter. We can see the two layers of gray matter. And we can even see a little bit of a sulcus. Are you going to ask us about the dendrites or? Um, we don't really see the dendrites. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Even at a high magnification, we're really not seeing the dendrites. Remember, it takes some kind of fluorescent imaging where we fill it with a fluorescent tressor where we can actually see those big elaborate dendritic trees. Okay. okay. Excellent. Ah, so much good stuff here. All right. Uh, let's do it this way. I'm... How many, um, how big is the histology part on our tests? I think you told us we'd have like around 65 questions, but as for the breakdown, you didn't know yet. You didn't uh, know. I think probably about 100, 150 questions will be histology. <laughs> I don't care. Uh, uh, So like I said, 60, 65 questions, 30 of it on the central nervous system. But then, I, I don't know, maybe 10, 15, something like that. I mean, however, think of it this way. However many slides there are on your his, histology handout, there could easily be one to two questions uh, per one of those slides. Now, it gets a little tricky because, for instance, notice, everything, all that anatomy we had to learn for the spinal cord, it's all right here. So right. again, you could argue that this is a histology question, but if I'm asking you to identify that structure, what is this structure that I'm pointing at right now? Dorsal root. Dorsal root. Dorsal root right. Is that really a histology question? No. No. But yeah. I mean, kind of, kind of yes, kind of no, right? So identify this structure. Dorsal root ganglion. Yeah. Identify this structure. Central root. Identify this structure. The lateral white columns. Yeah, identify this structure. Posterior white columns. Identify this space. Central canal. Identify, notice again, I wouldn't use this picture for this, but notice surrounding the central canal, notice how it's a little bit darker mm -hmm. on the slide. That's because there are some cells that are lining that. In fact, I think I have a picture of that. Yeah, there we go. Notice here up close in this up close view of the um, central canal, we can see the cells lining the central canal. And any idea what those cells lining the central canal might be? And diamond cells. Yeah, if you weren't sure, it literally says it right here on the slides. So clearly this wouldn't be the slide I would use on the exam, but uh, you can see that there very, very nicely. So, oops, uh, I don't want to go like that. So uh, again, so we could see that kind of a little bit there. Uh, and again, we know one other thing, identify the cell. So is that considered like the lateral? Oh, so what would, would be considered the lateral? Okay, so, okay I see what you're talking about. Okay, you're right. That is not a necessarily a fair uh, uh, question. So let's do it here. Identify that cell. 
face that would be the somatic i don't know yeah exactly anterior gray horn somatic motor neuron what is its structural classification multipolar and what is its functional classification Um, it's not like motor. Yeah. Notice again, your book's got some great pictures. Right. There's our lateral gray horn. There's our ventral gray horn or dorsal horn. Right. Notice one other thing I did want to point out about this here. Notice what can be a little bit tricky, as you guys correctly deduced. This is indeed the dorsal root ganglion. Notice it's towards the front, but that's just the way it was put on the slide. Notice it clearly connects to the back of the spinal cord. So just because it's sitting here in front of the spinal cord on the slide, pay attention to the root that's going to it. And so clearly, even though this is towards the front on the screen, this is clearly the dorsal root ganglion that we can see there. So don't get confused by something like that. So again, I'm, I'm not trying to be tricky by not answering your question about how much histology is on there because you could argue everything that I asked you right here was histology, but we're really not looking so much at the individual cells. We just happen to be looking at a histology slide. So that kind of makes a little sloppy. Right. So because, again, if I'm showing you this, it's clearly histology. But if I'm showing you an illustration of it, is that still histology? Right. If it's a picture of a spinal cord. So I don't know where those kind of fall in there. So a, a fair amount of it would be. But like I said, a fair amount of it is going to be like this. What is this structure? What is that structure? What is that structure? So stuff like that. Um, oh, and then again, think of it in terms of where we find our neurons. Remember, uh, as we said, all of these neurons in here are multipolar, and most of them are in the anterior gray horn. So remember, when we take that spinal cord smear and smear them along the uh, slide, we see these really nice cells with multiple processes coming out of them. Do I need to know which one's the axon and which one's the dendrites? No, just no. processes. No, I just need to know that they're processes. And clearly, this has more than two processes. So this is clearly a multipolar neuron. And because it's a smear, what function is this cell most likely have? Where did the cell most likely come from? The spinal cord. Well, it's definitely in the spinal cord, but if we smear those cells on there, what part of the spinal cord has the most multipolar neurons? Oh, the anterior. Anterior gray horn. So this is most likely from the anterior gray horn, which means what would its function be? Somatic motor. Exactly. Remember, if we wanted multipolar neurons, pardon me, unipolar neurons, we'd go to the dorsal root ganglion. Notice here, how many processes do you count on all of these cells? None. None. Because none of them have a process? No, just because we can't see it. Yeah, because all of them just have one stem coming off that apple. And when we cut through the bucket, we didn't get any of the stems. The other way you can clearly tell is these nice satellite cells that wrap around their circumference. So the lack of processes and the presence of these satellite cells are a dead giveaway you are in a dorsal root ganglion. The fact that you don't see a process is a dead giveaway. You've got a unipolar neuron in the dorsal root ganglion. And of course, what is its function? Sensory. Sensory. And notice some of these cells are darker than others. Why? What's the difference between these two cells? Why is one darker and one's lighter? I don't think there matters. Then if so if on the exam, I showed you this picture and I had a big fat arrow like this and I asked you to identify the substance, what would your answer to that be on the exam? Starts with the L, I think. Yeah, it does indeed start with the L. Lipofusion. Remember on your histology list, it's that undigestible fat. 
basically the liver spots that form in these cells as they get old. Remember, it doesn't affect their function or anything. It just, uh, it just colors them. They just build up this undigestible fat that doesn't serve any purpose. Like I said, they just show us that they're old. Like I said, just like the liver spots on grandpa. And then of course, lastly, here we see the retina. Notice again, we can see how the axons are coming together to form that optic nerve. So this would be that blind spot that we talked about. And when we look up close, as we talked about, we have three layers of cells. We have our photoreceptors, we have our bipolar neurons, and we have our ganglion cells. And these bipolar neurons, one axon to talk to the ganglion cell, one dendrite to receive information from the photoreceptors. So again, a location, retina, a structure, bipolar, a function, special sensory. All right. And I think, I think that's it, right? All right then. All right, so we are about out of time. I'll go ahead and call it at this point. Uh, if you guys have any more questions, again, I've got office hours right after class today. I've got office hours tomorrow. Uh, and then obviously my normal office hours for the rest of the week. I want to thank you all. Uh, for uh, 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 an incredible in semester. Again, I know there have been some tremendous challenges that have come with this online, and I applaud you guys for working your way through it and getting to this point, and I wish you great success in the rest of this class and also in the rest of your academic career. So if I don't see you guys again, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's been a good semester, and uh, I look forward to possibly seeing some of you on campus next semester. So it should be entertaining. Uh, we'll all have to wear pants, so that'll be one big difference. But other than that, I look forward to seeing all of you uh, in class next semester. So take care, have a good safe break, and uh, I hope to see you on campus next semester. All right, guys, uh, best of luck. Thank you so much. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.